content of this channel is for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advised. You're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel. Please make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell notification button. And please, feel free to share the video. Thank you. What's good, y'all? I'm GG, man. And of course, you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla channel. It's the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up with no chases. Without further ado, I'd like to give a shout out to all the members of the Green Gorilla channel. So let's take care of that business right now. Extra shouts out. Go out. To 7Q Pit, Kwaku Asasi, Super Tech, Liz Terrell. Rogish to Bill Munger, Michael Ross, and Gregory Oliver. Shouts out go to Darkside Excellence, Greg, Raiz Moji, Dornell Smith, and Antonio Ferrier. I'd also like to shout out Papa Didas, Barry Little, Alan Wiley, Mr. Valentino, and Jason Hales. Shout out to Black Men Being Brutally Honest, 77 Base X, Craig, and Omni Americana. Shout out to Cameron87, Deshaun Nolly, Brian Peaks, and Nelso. Shout out to Apex Prowler, Kareen Henry, Doc LaRock, Julius Ferguson, and B. Hillfire. Shout out to Jay Charles, Mark Holt, Lee Ways, and Jeffrey Speed. Shout out to The Face, Mark Swift, Show Me Black Dog, and Odd Collard. Shout out to Raphael Brown, Deanne, Donna Watts, Cozy Corner, and HipHop.ca TV. Shout out to Coach DC, The Remedy, Kashif Caldwell, Ominous Black, I Am Black Man, and Nichita. Shout out to True King 337, Mr. Blue Collar, Barnolas, Kyle J. Sura, and I'm Just Jules. Shout out to Ab Media 83, Brian McMurray, and TD Hip Hop Media. Shout out to Drew Main, Artisan MC, Mr. Heat, and Afro Analyst. Shout out to Issa Abdul Zahir, Sir Anthony, MLR, and Charles Rogers. Shout out to Universal 178, Black Swerve 404, Rasheed Barnes, and Aaron Smith. Shout out to DH, C Truth the Revelator, Gold Professor, Author Unknown, and Dr. Tia San Johnson. Shout out to uh, Kalan Jakala, Ricky Dawson, Cedric Bowman, and True7360. Shout out to BK Born Shahid, James Washington, Hostel ADEP, Seven Coast Dojo, and WPR1. And shouts out to BGS Ivmore, Marvin Battle Jr., and I can't forget my brother in heaven, Force Windu. Shout out to y'all, man. And on the Patreon side, I'd like to shout out Dornell Smith, Chris York, Excalibur, and Jason Warren. Soul Pen, Anu 219, Pursuer Prisoner, and Taz. Quaku 217, S. Haywood, and Dragon 59. Supreme Ibmore, Adrian Hicks, Jay Bailey, Mr. Michi Momal, and Asangwa. Shout out to y'all, man. I appreciate all of your help and all of your support, man. You deserve a round of applause. You get my highest honors, man. Straight up. Yes, you do, man. And if you're inquiring about how you too can become a member of the Green Gorilla channel, well, here is how you do it. What's good, everybody? I'm the G with a PhD, and you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla channel, the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up, no chaser. Today, I want to introduce you to my new membership program that consists of five levels where you can invest in the Green Gorilla channel on a monthly basis and receive level specific perks. Memberships are special because they improve the quality of the content of the channel and will help me to be able to keep the channel going. Now to participate in the Green Gorilla channel membership program, all you have to do is hit the join button, which is located right next to the subscribe button on my channel page. Now for all of my subscribers, who decide not to participate in my membership program, nothing will change. The content will keep coming the way it always has. Thanks for watching and be careful out here, people. Bless. All right, people, man, we're back.
You know where you are. You're tuned in to the Green Gorilla channel. You know who I be. I'm GG. And, uh, you know, today I'm going to talk about Max Weber, Calvinism, capitalism, and, uh, you know, being blessed and highly favored. Uh, and, you know, these things to me kind of run together. Uh, it's not one of the most exciting topics to discuss, but it's exciting to me. I like it. Uh, it's something that's of interest to me. And uh, the last video I did, some of the brothers uh, said that it would interest them. So I'm doing it for their sake. Uh, it's not, you know, a clapback video on, you know, black women or other black people, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of those videos gain a lot of traction and garner a lot of attention. But, you know, it's not always uh, something that I want to engage in. I, you know, I got other things that I think about and that I intellectualize about as well. So, um, in order to facilitate this conversation, what I'm going to do is uh, show you a couple of videos like I did last time. And, uh, you know, that way it could do the heavy lifting of giving you information about who Max Weber is. But, uh, you know, I can give you some uh, preliminary remarks about who Max Weber uh, is and its importance. Um, so, so, for the most part, you know, he uh, was a German sociologist. He was a historian, he was a jurist, and he was a political economist. And uh, he's regarded as among the most important theorists on the development of modern Western culture and society. And his ideas would profoundly influence social theory and social research itself. So, in other words, he's one of the founding fathers of the discipline of sociology itself along with a few others. Uh, one other is Augusta Comte and Emil Durkheim. But it's interesting, you know, for you to know that uh, Weber didn't really see himself as a sociologist. He thought he was a historian. OK, uh, but that's, you know, that's the, the precursory or preliminary. Uh, you know, outlining of who uh, Max Weber is and his importance. I mean, yeah. You know, <laughs> Anybody that goes to college has to take sociology courses and you're bound to uh, bump across the work of Max Weber. OK, but anyway, what does Max Weber have to do with capitalism? Uh, well, he theorized about it. Uh, but what does Christianity have to do with capitalism and particularly what kind of or form of uh, Christianity uh, has any link? To uh, capitalism. Well, Weber's argument is that Lutheranism, or not necessarily Lutheranism, but Protestantism, and in particular Calvinism, has a link to capitalism. So that that's his argument. Okay. Now you can take it or leave it. You can buy it or not buy it. Um, I'm not here to uh, sell it or not sell it, but I'm here to present it and uh, you know to give you some information about what it is. He says is the uh, cause or the main catalyst or the impetus behind, you know, this idea of the work ethic, because, I mean, I'm pretty sure you've all heard of the Protestant work ethic. I'm, I'm damn sure you've heard of that. OK, if you haven't heard of that, man, you've been laying underneath the rock. <laughs> I guarantee you that. But a shout out to everybody out there in the chat. I, I just want to uh, acknowledge some people. I want to shout out Ian Graves, uh, uh, D.H., BGS Ibmo, I see you in the house. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Cameron87, a sore of C, Donald Watts, and uh, shout out to Charles Rich, man. Thank you so much for the donation. Appreciate your help and your support. Appreciate that. Adam Williams, shout out to you. Uh, shout out to uh, Sir Abadiah. Uh, Barry Little, man, you always hold me down in the chat, man. I appreciate that. And uh, John Reeves, too much, man. Much support and love to you as well. Uh, excuse me, as well. I see you, Shaw. I see you out there. And Shango the Eternal, I see you out there as well, man. I'm just acknowledging people in the chat, man. Every now and then, I, you know, I, I raise my head up and I look at what's being said in the chat. But anyway, let's just get right to this, man. What is, uh, you know, the link between Calvinism and capitalism? Again, so I got two videos, um, you know, and I'm going to interrupt them as I watch them and give my commentary. But... You already know that, man. So let's just get right to it. Let's get to the first one and then we'll move to the second one. 
And then I'll, you know, after that, I'll, I'll have some remarks about it. And then I'll open up the chat. Uh, excuse me. I'll open up uh, StreamYard and see if you want to comment on it. So anyway, here's the first video. Those who pursue religion often turn away from worldly affairs. They're suspicious of wealth and business, preferring an ascetic life of contemplation and prayer. The sociologist and economist Max Weber argued that after the Reformation, one form of Christian Protestantism, Calvinism, encouraged a different attitude to work, with far-reaching effects. Calvinists believed in predestination. A precise number of souls would go to heaven. The lucky ones had places reserved by God. However, most Calvinists were terrified there would be no seat awaiting them in paradise. They were always on the lookout for signs that they had been saved. One clear indication that they were on the guest list was that they were actively contributing to their community through their work. All right, so let me. There's a lot going on there, man. <laughs> the first thing you get is Lutheranism, then you get Calvinism, and uh, you know some people don't understand the sequence of this. But uh, so you had Martin Luther, whom Martin Luther King Jr. is named after, who started a movement uh, in you know England, and it was called protestantism okay so martin luther was the the one who created this he came up with 95 theses which you see listed on the graphic here or on the video here right and so uh one of his main complaints was that the catholic church was corrupt and i'll talk about that a little bit later uh i don't want to let the cat out of the bag now but also what he wanted to do was to demonstrate that you don't need someone to intercede on your behalf in order to gain access to God. You don't need a priest. <laughs> you don't need, you know, somebody wearing a robe where you go to a confessional and who can help you through uh, this eat intermediary, absolve you of your sins. No, all you need is yourself and your faith. That's all you need. Okay. Uh, so this, this marks a challenge to the power of the Catholic Church. But the Catholic Church was, you know, losing credibility because of the rampant corruption within it. And so uh, one could argue that Martin Luther uh, was uh, refreshing. He was a corrective uh, to some of the, the excesses and the indulgences that were taking place within Catholicism. Uh, but also one could argue that Lutheranism, or excuse me, Protestantism, uh, was... Uh, the catalyst for contemporary democracy as well. I mean, there are people who make that argument also, but I don't want to get too far off the beaten path, but I'm just trying to give you, you know, an outline to understand the historical, uh, you know, timeline in which these things are taking place. All right. So let's push. In his book, the Protestant. Oh, and by the way, this whole notion of predestination, man, it, to me is absolutely crazy. All right. Uh, you know, I was raised as a Catholic. I mean, my mother wasn't deeply religious, nor was my father. But I was, you know, forced to go to a Catholic school throughout most of my youth. And so this is where I gained my belief system. You know, I, I just went to a Catholic school and uh, the Catholics don't necessarily push the idea of predestination. But, uh, you know, I became deeply religious as a young guy. Uh in, in my early high school years, but then I rejected it altogether. And primarily I rejected uh, Christianity to some degree was because of this whole notion of predestination. Uh, I just thought it was a, a slick and a clever way for white people to assert that, you know, they were amongst God's chosen people. And of course, as you know, me being a young black man, I was like, man, if this is not complete and utter bullshit, I don't know what is. So I rejected it and I went to Afrocentricism from there. But that's what that's the path that I took. I'm just letting you know. OK. All right. So let's keep pushing. Ethic and the spirit of capitalism. Weber argued that the Calvinists need to reassure themselves through their industry was an important factor in the growth of capitalism in northern Europe. 
They built up businesses that generated wealth, but at the same time lived thrifty lives. They reinvested any surplus and so helped fuel capitalism. Eventually, capitalism would have a life and momentum of its own. But according to Weber, at least, its initial impetus came from a theological source. Okay, so that, that's, that's the first video I wanted to show you. All right, so... Uh, again, like I said, you can either take this or leave this, but this information is what is being disseminated by one of the founding fathers of the discipline of sociology itself. He basically says that when you look at capitalism, you have to understand the theological uh, sources for uh, the motivations and rationalization of that economic policy. Now, you know, I, I'm straddling the fence on this. You know, I think that there's something there to some degree, but I'm not fully there because, I mean, I'm also aware of the ways in which capitalism was brought about by slavery. Okay, so I, I'm also mindful of this. But the other, the other video I want to show you is it's a little bit longer, but it's it's good as well. Uh, so check it out. And then after that, uh, I'm going to take a quick break, read a few pages uh, from some abstracts of some journal, uh, uh, scholarly journals, some articles. And then after that, uh, I'll open up the floor. So uh, let's get into the second video, man. Max Weber is one of the philosophers best able to explain to us the peculiar economic system we live within called capitalism. Born in Erfurt in Germany in 1864, Weber grew up to see his country convulsed by the dramatic changes of the Industrial Revolution. Cities were exploding in size, vast companies were forming, a new managerial elite was replacing the old aristocracy. Weber spent his life analysing these changes, and he developed some key ideas with which we can better understand the workings and future of capitalism. The standard view is that capitalism began as a result of developments in technology, especially steam power. But Weber proposed something more interesting, that what actually made capitalism possible was a set of ideas, and in particular religious ideas. And not just any religious ideas, capitalism was created by Protestantism, specifically Calvinism. In his great work, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, published in 1905, Weber laid out some of the reasons why he believed Protestant Christianity had been so crucial to capitalism. In Weber's analysis, Catholics have it relatively easy. They're able to confess their transgressions at regular intervals and can be cleansed by priests but no such purifications are available to Protestants, who believe that only God is able to forgive anyone, and he won't make his intentions known until the Day of Judgment. Until then, Weber alleged, Protestants are left with heightened feelings of anxiety, as well as lifelong guilty desires to prove their virtue to a severe, all-seeing, but silent God. Now, let me stop here, man. <laughs> now, if Weber is correct, if he's correct, essentially, uh, uh, many Anglos believe that they are members of the eternal elect. I mean, they believe that they're God's chosen people. But that has another implication. Guess what? Black man, black women, you're not. <laughs> so black Israelites... The NOI, Black Baptist, Kojic, all that, uh, that, you're laughable to these people. In many of their eyes, you are primitive, you're lazy and shiftless. I'm just keeping it 100. And if cleanliness and thrift are considered to be next to godliness, then you are the filthiest and most superficially wasteful incarnations of man in existence. You're like little demons, little devil childs. <laughs> I'm just keeping it real, man. I mean, if, if all of this is true, but I'm going to keep pushing, man. 
In Weber's eyes, Protestant feelings of guilt were diverted into an obsession with hard work. This was what he called the Protestant work ethic. The sins of Adam could only be expunged through constant toil. Not coincidentally, there were far fewer festivals and days of rest in Protestantism. God didn't like time off. <laughs> hey man, God does not like vacations, okay? In fact, you know, right now I'm mad at God for taking a break on the Sabbath day. He shouldn't have took no time off according to his own creed, right? But that's sacrilege. Let me stop before I get struck by lightning as I <laughs> do my show. But, I mean, come on, man. You got to think about this. God likes, he loves hard work. Now, of course, not everyone from every culture thinks in this way. But another thing that puzzles me, I'm just puzzled by this, right? I'm just puzzled by it, right? Puzzle, puzzle, puzzle. Why? Because if they love work so much and they love hard work so much, why do they have slaves? Why was it necessary for them to go and get some slaves, man? Why? They should have done all the hard work themselves. And then they could have demonstrated through their own agency and their own hard work, their deservingness of all the material accoutrements that have accrued to them from Western, you know, their, their own culture. Do their own work and agency. I mean, wh why they need slaves? I'm just asking the question. Now, maybe you got a different answer than I do. I, you know, it is what it is. I, you know. I mean, shit, they love work so much. Why ain't they do the work they got themselves? Why have to transport, you know, why transport millions of people from one landmass to another to do the dirty and the hard work for you? <laughs> Ian Gray says Adam was cursed with the need to till or work. Okay, well, he was, but what about us? Like we were cursed by them to do the work for them? I thought they love work. You love work so much. Well, you know, get get to it. Why make other people do it for you? That's just my opinion. But, you know, OK. Catholics had limited their conception of holy work to the activities of priests, monks and nuns. But now Protestants declared that work of any kind could be done in the name of God, even jobs like being a baker or an accountant. This lent new moral energy and earnestness to all branches of professional life. And let me let me let me stop here, man. I kid you not, man. I've heard people act as if, you know, whatever work they do is like a personal ministry or some shit. You know, like <laughs> like if they lift weights, I'm lifting lace, I'm, I'm lifting weights for Christ. Or, you know, if they're in medicine, they're doing the medicine for Jesus. Or, you know, if they work, you know, in fast food, they got a fast food ministry or something. <laughs> like the whole, oh, you know, idea about what they're doing is orientated towards being called to do it and to do it for Christ. Have you have you ever heard of this? If you've heard of that before, man, put a one in the chat. <laughs> but I, I just find that odd as well, man, that, that people connect their work to their concept of God. But, you know. It is what it is. In Catholic countries, the family was, and often still is, everything. But Protestants took a less benevolent view of family. The family could be a haven for selfish and egoistic motives. For early Protestants, one was meant to direct one's selfless energies to the community as a whole, the public realm where everyone deserved fairness and dignity. This is also something I, you know, I kind of take pause with. So, so the idea was that the the locus of the most importance with Catholicism was the family. But then as it, you know, pertained to Protestantism, it was the community. So your hard work was supposed to provide utility for the community, not just necessarily for your own family. But I mean, if that's the case, man, we've meandered and veered far away from the path of Protestantism because, uh, you know, 
Also, it doesn't really square up nicely with, uh, you know, classical liberalism, which is supposed to be about individuals pursuing their own self-interest. And then the externality or, the, you know, the, the effect of that being uh, Pareto optimality or optima optimality for the whole, for everyone. But, you know, it, it's just something I, you know, I'm taking a little bit of a uh, pause with here. Um, let's keep pushing. Protestantism and eventually scientific capitalism turned its back on miracles. Weber called this the disenchantment of the world. So prosperity wasn't to be thought of as something mysteriously ordained by God. It could only be the result of thinking methodically, acting honestly, and working industriously and sensibly over many years. Without a belief in miracles, people turned to science for explanations and changes, which encouraged scientific investigation and discovery, and eventually technological booms. Taken together, these five factors created in Weber's eyes the crucial catalytic ingredients for capitalism to take hold. Marx had argued that religion was the opium of the masses, a drug that induced passive acceptance of the horrors of capitalism. But Weber turned this dictum on its head. People didn't tolerate capitalism because of religion. They only became capitalists as a result of their religion. There are about 35 countries. Okay, so uh, this is where this is, uh, you know, where things get a little bit uh, sketchy and dicey. Uh, you know, the whole thing is at this point about to take, you know, the leap away from, okay, well, what were the origins of capitalism to now? How do we proliferate capitalism throughout the entirety of the world? And, uh, you know, most people who are American assume that capitalism is the predominant economic model throughout the entirety of the world. It is not. Uh, but, or, or either they'll say it's the most efficient or it's the best, you know, or, or the most optimal form of, uh, distribution. Uh, I'm not here to argue about the booms or uh, the evils associated with capitalism. I'm just here to give you Max Weber. All right. So let me continue. Please, where capitalism is now well developed. It probably works best in Germany where Weber first observed it. But in the remaining 161 nations, it arguably isn't working very well at all. This is a source of much puzzlement and distress. Billions of dollars in aid are transferred every year from the rich to the poor parts of the world. But a Weberian analysis tells us that these materialist interventions will never work, because the problem isn't really a material one to begin with. Instead, certain countries for Weber fail to succeed at capitalism because they don't feel anxious and guilty enough. They trust too much in miracles. They like to celebrate now rather than invest in tomorrow. And their members feel it's acceptable to steal from the community in order to enrich their families, favoring the clan over the nation. Now, this I don't like about this video right here. I mean, you know, you put a witch doctor up on the, on the damn screen, you know, and uh, you put, you know, people who are basically non-white. They put one picture of a, a white woman with a kid, but... I mean, come on, man. I mean, basically, everybody else is lazy because they have a different kind of theological orientation. Uh, and t I get it to some degree. I, un I understand where he's going with this. But come on, man. Like, it's ridiculous to me. I mean, think about ancient cultures that are non-Western and, and some of the marvels that they, you know, that they were able to accomplish architecturally, uh, intellectually. Why just assume that, you know, uh, that these people, you know, just, you know, don't have the right kind of ethos in order to develop or breed, uh, you know, or, or inspire thriftiness and hard work. I, I just, you know, I don't I don't like that. But anyway, let me keep pushing. Today, Weber would counsel those who wish to spread capitalism to concentrate on our equivalent of religion, culture. It's a nation's attitudes, hopes, and a sense of what life is about that produces an economy that either flourishes or flounders. To reduce poverty, Weber would say, one has to start at the level of ideas. What the World Bank and the IMF should be giving sub-Saharan Africa is not, in a Weberian analysis, money and technology, but a new outlook. The decisive question for an economy should not be what the rate of inflation is, but what's on TV tonight. Weber was writing in an age of revolution. He too wanted things to change, but he believed that one first had to work out how political power operated. Weber believed that humanity had gone through three distinct types of power. 
the older societies operated according to what he called traditional authority, where kings relied on folklore and divinity to justify their power. Then came the age of charismatic authority, where a heroic individual, most famously Napoleon, could rise to power with a magnetic personality and change everything through passion and will. Let me stop it here. I, I, I really believe that black folks are caught up in this charismatic HNIC mode of, of leadership. I'm, just, I'm convinced of it. I'm just keeping it 100, man, because if they were not, they would create bureaucratic institutions in order to solve the problems. And it wouldn't happen through charisma or, you know, it wouldn't happen because some leader, you know, has followers or people, you know, who are, are caping for him. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, this is just my my belief. It's just mine. OK. Or they cut it off. All right. I don't know if it's back or not. Uh, are we back? <laughs> are we back in this joint, man? We back. Anyway, man, uh, you know, I'm going to stop showing the video, man, because they saying I'm doing a policy uh, violation or something like that, man. Uh, <laughs> I'm just like, how can you uh, review something or uh, analyze something? But anyway, it's all to the good, man. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to play this anymore. I, I think we went through uh, what we needed to go through in order to get through this. Uh, but. Yeah, I'm sick of YouTube too, man. YouTube be on some bull shit. You know, they uh they find ways uh you know, they 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 find ways to uh, you know, throw a monkey wrench in what you're doing. But they they don't stop motherfucking shit from like none of us. They don't stop like our shit from being out there, but they stop everybody else's shit from being out there or being evaluated. You know, it it just is what it is, man. So anyway, uh, that's, uh, you know, Max Weber, man. Uh, I'm not going to show this shit anymore, bro. Uh, and I'm surprised that, uh, you know, the school of, the school of life would, would have uh, any copyright claims on their videos to begin with. But, uh, yeah, so anyway, man, there are people who have different ideas and viewpoints about this. And I'm going to show you, uh, I'm not going to even take a break because that was a kind of a break to begin with. So let me show you, uh, let me go to my display screen and show you what some people have to say about this. All right. So there are some people who argue against Weber in general. I mean, they just basically say that, you know, Weber is wrong. And I'm just giving you, uh, you know, an example to, to, to illustrate that some people do make this this argument that like Weber is just way off track. All right. Now, one such person is uh, Milan Zafirovsky, and he says uh, that, you know, any proof for Calvinism, uh, capitalism thesis, probably not. OK. And the paper he has is called Any Proofs for the Calvinism Capitalist Thesis, The Exemplars of the Rule Examined. All right, so the abstract is not really all that long, but you can get the gist of where he's going with this. He says, look, the paper considers, or excuse me, reconsiders the Weber thesis of Calvinism and modern capitalism assumed in causal association or affinity and congruence as the independent or dependent variable respectively within its social economics. The analysis focuses on the Weber thesis and its historical component by identifying and re-examining its supposed proofs in historically Calvinist societies. It thus reconsiders the presumed exemplars of the Calvinism capitalism rule in most of these societies. Specifically, it identifies and analyzes certain relevant historical deviations from the Weber thesis in the assumed exemplars of its rule. The first major deviation is that Pre-industrial capitalism as an economic practice, its spirit and practice arises and exists prior to Calvinism and Calvinist and other Western societies. The second deviation is that the modern industrial capitalism develops and expands long after the rise and extension and actually during the decline of Calvinism in these societies. 
So generally, the paper aims to contribute to a better understanding and further development of the Weber thesis and its related sociological conceptions of the relationship between economy and society, including religions, ideology, and culture. So he's not a, a, a Weber believer. I mean, you know, that's what that says. I'm just reading the abstract. I know it's a little bit convoluted, graduated terminology, kind of obtuse, but he's not a believer in what, we what Weber is selling. But then you got another uh, article uh, written by Dennis for CC, and he basically says that, uh, and this is the abstract, and the paper he wrote is called Calvinism, Capitalism, and Confusion, the Weberian, uh, the Weberian Thesis Revisited. And what he says is, is Mac Weber's well-known discussion of the relationship between the Protestant ethic and capitalism has occasioned a vast amount of discussion, much of it critical. It is our contention that the Weberian Thesis has been done in injustice in the course of this dialogue, for with few exceptions, the critics do not appear to have argued to the point. Weber's intention was to demonstrate a relationship between Calvinism and a peculiar form of capitalism. Not in terms of genesis, but in terms of feedback. Weber granted that the Protestant ethic which he described differed in form and emphasis from that immediately following the Reformation and that it had altered in response to a developing capitalism. But Weber sought to demonstrate that this altered ethic in turn influenced capitalism, serving as an impetus to its further development to a stage characterized by what Weber called the capitalist ethos. So he by no means imputed monocausality or single causality, but uh, uh, nor did he assume that he had at all explain the origins of capitalism rather he focused upon the institutionalization of the capitalist complex and here the effect of ideology appear vital so there are people who support him people who deny him that's just how this goes okay so then the question be, becomes well what do you think What do you think? But anyway, uh, you know, I'm going to take a quick commercial break, man. And when I come back, I'll open up the lines to see what you got to say, man. If you got anything to say at all, I'll be right back. All right, man, I'm back. I'm a little pissed off that my video got cut right in the middle of it, but you know, it is what it is. So, uh, you know, I don't know, man, you know, this whole idea about being blessed and highly favored to me is linked to Calvinism. That's just my opinion uh, is, is, is linked to Christianity and the idea that, you know, God is blessing you, you know, and, uh, you know, how, how well you do in life has to do with how much God is blessing you. I, I you know, I just don't buy it. Uh, I'm just keeping it 100. I don't buy it. I don't. Um, but what do you think? I don't know, man. Uh, the idea that capitalism is related to Protestantism and Calvinism in general. What do you think about it? But I know one thing. Their proof for themselves or of their status among the elect is demonstrated in their ability to acquire material possessions and money. You can't do that. You don't have the same uh, ability to do it. So their wealth and success 
to the extent that they actually have it, is an indication of God's favor or grace being bestowed upon them. But black folks talk like this, you know, they, they talk like they're blessed and highly favored as well. Although if you look at the macroeconomic trends, you'll discover like black folks ain't got a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. Not for real. You ain't got no bread like that. You ain't got money like that. And all of this, so the idea is that all of the quest for them to attain wealth is connected to the ideas about work, which are connected to the ideas about, you know, salvation. So the, the impetus is, you know, wanting to be in heaven. That's what's driving them. I, I don't know if I buy that, man. I'm just keeping it 100. I don't know if I buy that. But black people sure do talk like this. Do they not? Black people talk like this all the time. And they'll stigmatize other black folks, you know, for being like in a less than desirable position economically. And, you know, as if it has something to do with their morality. Real talk. And, you know, I don't know, man. I mean, I guess, uh, you know, black folks are actually Christianized and Westernized to the extreme. Anyway, man, let me go to Chaos Rain. Chaos Rain, what's going on? No good, um, Green Gorilla. What's going um, on? My question during the subject, and my honest opinion, do you feel our folks, black people in general, really care about where this economy is going and where we're going to fall in the next, let's say, 20 years? Since all this information has been revealed for some time now, probably years now, and our people not really pay attention to the science, you know? Even even to the point where we talk about the black wealth is going to be obsolete in the next 33 years. You know. No, I don't think they're paying attention to it at all. They just want what they want right now. You talk about delayed gratification. Like, black folks don't have delayed gratification. But, I mean, a lot of times black people don't have the uh, capacity to uh, even work with the framework of delayed gratification because they're always trying to remedy uh, tragedy immediately. <laughs> Now, whether that's a fault of their own or not, I mean, you know, I, I had I did a show yesterday, man, that kind of talked about where the uh, market is, not the market, but the economy is going and the spending power of, of the middle class and how it's shrinking. And if it's shrinking, it, it has to have already shrunk for black folks. So then the question becomes, well, what what is the future for us? Mm. If, the, if the economy is increasingly deindustrializing and becoming more and more automated. And, it, and we already know black folks can't read. Black boys, particularly. We, we can't read. Yeah. If we can't read, we can't do math. If we can't read and we can't do math, we damn sure can't be a member of the financial sector of the economy. How do you do it? Uh -huh. <laughs> how many of you know how to perform linear equations? Uh -huh. Like, I mean, I'm just asking a question. Because, or, or how to, you know, do calculus. Because, yeah. I mean, you need that in order to be, you know, in the finance. Well, you don't have to, but, I mean, it, it would help. You, you should know as much math as possible and to master as many as possible. I don't want to say that to be a superior expert, but you should have to understand the basics. But, like you said, in these institutions, if most of our children are not even getting the basics right, then you're not going to go far off. And usually reading is one of the key factors. And I know you read enough books and you hear of a scholar named Amos and Wilson. He tells one of the few things that get niggers caught up is the word. Yeah. And that is just the hieroglyphs, the, the coded language. And we don't really understand this so-called English language well enough. Even the words, the definitions they put out here, it confuses Negroes. At one time, we did get a grasp of it back in the 1800s to a degree when we were, I guess, released from the physical harms because they already did analysis for the first 30 years after enslavement, most black men read, or black people, but just black men in general, read um, very well to the point we progressed very fast in under 30 years than everybody else. So I always think, say, what they did to really tamper that. And I think one of the things they did was, you know, we could say certain Jim Crow laws put in place and, you know, certain things put in place to really start tamper how far we try to improve our intelligence while living in this so-called system. To the point when we, we hit to the 70s now, 
it just went downhill completely. Well, I, you know, I, I actually don't know what black literacy rates were among uh, mm -hmm. black men, you know, doing slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know that they were forced not to be, you know, literate uh, yeah. under threat of punishment and sometimes mm -hmm. even the punishment of death, not just mm -hmm. whipping and flogging. But, uh, you know, uh, you talk about a hell of a uh, incentive to not become aware. <laughs> I mean, if you read, we'll kill you. That's crazy. But I mean, that that's some of the, you know, uh, some of the things that occurred. But uh, yeah. uh, what I don't know, man. Uh, blacks, man, it's not that difficult, man. Language is not that hard, man. I, I just don't understand what, what we're not able to do and why we're not able to do it. But I guess it's parenting. I mean, you yeah. know, kid, kids do what their parents do. Like I, I saw my parents read. Mm -hmm. I, I, I tell this story all the time. I had a best friend, you know, uh, throughout my formative years, my my earliest years. Uh, Ian, you can come back, man. I, I'm sorry I ain't put you on, but uh, my earliest years, man, I had a friend, and uh, his mother couldn't read. Okay. But my mother could read. His couldn't. Mine could. My mother had a master's degree. His mother didn't graduate from uh, grade school. So as a result, he couldn't read. Mm. I mean, he didn't see the importance of reading. It, it was like breathing to me to be able to read. To him, it was like this arduous task to be able to, you know, decipher words and to understand language. And that's primarily because, you know, you understand language most easily when you're younger. You know what I'm saying? But the older you get, the more hard it is for you to grasp the meaning of words. So you need this. This is something that needs to happen at, a, at the youngest years, the most formative ages. But, you know, that's just my opinion about that. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because right here, back, um, because when I take myself particularly when I was younger, I didn't take reading really seriously. You know, like when you're a boy, you just like eh, nothing. You know, you have parents that were stricken and you know, you have followed around that to make you have to push you and make sure there's some form of punishment. Some form, not great, but some form. If you not if you don't do this, I'll make sure you, you better do this. You get me? So at times you know you have to be forced at the end of the day because you have to have somebody that's stronger to try to make sure the emphasis of it. But if you are raised in a certain household where the mother see there's no significance, either if she could read or not, the child's not going to do it unless he goes to a school system. You get me? So it has to be reinforcement at the home because a lot of parents, let's be honest, Green Greer, are complacent. They think if you throw your child in an institution, that they should be fine. And we know from the data and the history of this country, that is not the case. Oh, yeah. Laziness and complacency will result in laziness and complacency with your own offspring. And we all know the end result when a child is at so-called third grade reading level. They know how many prisons they're going to be building. Overall. That, and that's the dilemma, you know. Uh, that's that's the dilemma, you know. Uh, but all the hard work, you know, now the hard work, I don't know what you got going on in the background, man. You need to uh, adjust the background. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, but um Black folks, man, you know, they used to work hard with their bodies, particularly black men. But you can't just work hard with your body anymore. That's that kind of work is gone. All the power plants. Uh, you know, the, the steel mills, the assembly factories for vehicles, all the manufacturing base of this country is pretty much I ain't gonna say it's all gone, but it's gone. So what next? Now you have to use your brain. And unfortunately, you know, uh. Man, we got some work ahead of us, bro. That's all I can say. Irv Saint, what's going on? Okay. Irv Saint, what's happening? What's up, Green Gorilla, man? What's going on, man? What's happening with you? What's going on? Good dis good discussion, brother. Um, you're absolutely right about the uh uh the literacy rates for young black men. Um one thing I I I I learned about it helped me and my kid and you know other kids was phonics right when phonics was introduced but well, it's not a it's not a new concept but phonics certainly helped a lot of people 
um, uh, learn the grasp of, of words and learning uh, English and how to make words sound out words as you go. Right. We, people were doing this, but they, they came up with this concept in teaching in schools in the 1960s. So you have a lot of boomers who did, weren't introduced to that. If you notice that some boomers have trouble spelling, it's because of the, that it was never introduced, especially in the segregated South, the segregated schools. But if you take your time with your kids, just time, but time is a, is, is, is a resource. So, you know, if you take that time, though, you can definitely have a kid that can uh, read at an accelerated level, but it takes practice and time. Well, you know, the, the first thing that, you know, that has to be done, to be perfectly honest, you got to read to the kids. Like if, if, if kids, kids value what they see their parents actually doing. I mean, if they don't see you doing it. They're not going to do it themselves because they're not going to see you valuing what you say you value. So, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, the first thing that has to happen is, you know, you have to see it in action. And then after that, you have to see value in it on your own terms. I mean, as a kid, you know, you all I don't know what kind of stories you liked as a kid, but I like, you know, stories of kings, you know, and and. Knights and, you know, uh, heroes conquering monsters and stuff like that with swords and guns, you know, and, and, and I, that's what I like, you know. And so, I, you know, I could use my imagination and kids do have imagination. But, you know, I don't know, man, you know, the TV now, I mean, literacy is down, man. And there are a lot of reasons for it. But, uh, you know, one of those reasons is, you know, parental involvement. And, but. How do you find time? Like right now, you know, most of our, I ain't going to say most of our uh, households are single parent, but a lot of them are. So what happens when you got a single parent coming home from work? They're tired as hell. Now you got to help a kid do some homework. And, you know, you've been beat exactly. up all day. You've been on your feet all day. And, you know, you're dependent upon these teachers in the, the public school system to make sure that your kid is learning what he or she needs to learn so that they can be successful and competitive in the marketplace. But you don't have the, you know, actual time and the energy to it's expend. It's going to get worse because with, with the, the, the uh, remote learning and nobody watching, man, could you imagine Gigi? Like, you know, I, I, I needed a structure. To uh oh, you went out. You know, remote learning is showing telling of the miseducational system of this country. With a lot of students that failed during the pandemic, if you're not aware, Green Gorilla. Oh yeah, I'm 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 aware so, of it. So so it tells you that what if people didn't know that this education either public charter or whatever, it's not working. And if your parent you lazy and you leave your day you know, your um fate and destiny to these people, like Malcolm or Elijah said, then you get the same outcomes. There's no way around it. So it tells you that for us as black people, a lot of soul search need to be done and a lot of things need to be changed. But like I said, we're only a few people. I'm going to say one thing before um, the guy gets his mic back on. I remember one sister said that it was not her responsibility, you know, for in regards to what to do for the boys. When I heard that, it's very telling. Who, so you, on, who, first, of all, who, first of all, who said that? Um, well, and what was, was the context of her saying that? Well, I think one dude was asking, and I'm trying to remember now that um, in regards to, I don't know, it was the educational piece in regards to the boys, but you know, most women feel that it should be the responsibility of the men, you know, create a foundation, you know, teach boys certain things, you know. Okay, but I couldn't okay. remember much. So I, I probably will just lay out there. If I remember more, I'll clarify. But that's why I remember from a conversation so i leave it there yeah I, you know um so let the men take care of the, the boys and the, the women take care of the girls and if the boys are underperforming it's because the lack of involvement of the men or the fathers and that's in all some way that's what she's saying in a way it's not verbatim but the way how she expressed that's what you know it's laid out that did she, she have did she have children did she have a son 
I believe she has some children, some boys. I don't know if it's one or two. Yeah, because, you know, if a woman has children and, and her children are boys or males and she's thinking this, then, you know, that that's bullshit. <laughs> like, you, you, you don't care about the education of your own children? That's fucking bizarre. But, I mean, this is where we are, where you have ideologies in place that call for people to care more about people they don't know in abstract than people they actually do know who are their family members. This is how twisted this shit has gotten. But it is what it is. You, you would think that you would care more about your child specifically who has your genetic, uh, genetic imprint than you would care about some abstract, you know, group of women. But, you know, this is, this is, this is where we are. It is what it is. And I don't think we're turning back anytime soon. That's just my opinion. I, I don't. Yeah. I mean, and the reason why I'm just laying it out, because at the end of the day, they say the children are the future. So you want, if it's not you alone, you always, as a parent, care enough to say, what can I do to, you know, to get, to get the best outcomes from at least the boys if I have sons? And a lot of women that either have sons or not, they have to be thinking like this. But like I said, you know, women, you know, they have a different perspective and, you know, what they do. So, like I said, you know, if they're leaving their destiny through others, other teachers and institutions that we don't really control like that, it's telling. You get me? Even the point when I heard last year from a lot of guys from this space about how the women, you know, push back in regards to um, certain policies when Obama's in office to help the boys is uh -huh. very much telling. They're saying, you know, out of everything, if your sons fail, you fail it by default. And the race goes more to the shitter. Well, that's if you feel, well, that's if you feel your fates are interconnected and intertwined. Yes. But if you don't feel like your fates are interconnected and intertwined, then it's not a failure for you at all. It's indicative of your child's failure or the school system's failure. It's everybody's failure except for your own. Right. Uh, but, you know, this is this is one of the dilemmas, you know, of, of the independence of black womanhood. At the current moment. So the idea is you're free to be able to do what you want. You're free to work. You're free to choose who you want to be with. But at the same time, it has an adverse impact on your progeny to live alone and then to take on all the responsibility and the task yourself because you don't want anybody to tell you what to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I put up an image one day, uh, you know, of a woman who was doing everything. She was going to work cooking, cleaning. I mean, that's a, that's exactly what you've called upon yourself to do and that the burden you've put on yourself by just being irascible and not wanting anyone to tell you what to do in the confines of the home or having to, you know, cooperate and collaborate with somebody because then you, you can't just do exactly what you want to do. You have to be able to, you know, give a little and then receive a little and to reciprocate and, you know, to, to, to you know, basically sometimes to be able to mediate issues and problems. But if you if you feel like you're a God and nobody can tell you anything, then those kind of arrangements are going to look less and less attractive to you. But that's you don't have they, yeah. they're not having to do it all. They're just they're they're choosing to do it all because they don't want to be told what to do. That's just exactly. my assessment. That's my assessment of the situation. BGS, what's good, my brother? How you doing? Hey, yeah, Doc. Man of the hour with the lightsaber. You know what I'm saying? Uh. Go out there, slap them with that. <laughs> Say, yo, you better read to these little niggerets, man. Here, 30 minutes a day. That's all that's required. <laughs> you well, basically, this is just uh, an extension of uh, of the, the slave cabin, right? Um, it was illegal to teach a black uh, a black slave to leave. It was never illegal to teach a black woman to read or to or to or to uh, for her to learn, even even in the slave quarters. It was illegal to teach a black male to read or, or teach a black male. And uh, even uh, I was reading uh, the, years ago, I was reading about the Mohawk Conference of 1890 about the Negro problem. Right. And even there, they were saying it wasn't necessary for a black man to read. But it was necessary for a woman to read because she had to be able to take care of bills and take care of the household and somewhat teach her children. And that stuff has been passed down. That uh, they was not necessary to educate a black man because they can work with their hands, and that's crazy. But uh, you know, um, 
I mean, you got some of the greatest thinkers and intellectuals, you know, during the period of Reconstruction mm-hmm. and shortly thereafter. We're talking about mm-hmm. Booker T. Washington, Frederick mm-hmm. Douglass, you know, yeah. great orators, masters mm-hmm. of uh, the English language. I mean, of yeah. course, they didn't have the distractions that we have today. Yeah, yeah. But uh, even and, then, even then, there were anomalies, you know, in the black community. Yeah, you know, yeah, they, this is true. Not, they, 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 in fact, they, they weren't, they didn't come from, uh, the, most of the black men were illiterate uh, up until... Uh, really, uh, really, really, most black men were illiterate up until the uh, to the 1960s. Were, were, were functionally illiterate, and many of us are still functionally functionally and illiterate. Well, I didn't want to say that, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say that, Doc. But but the thing is, is that it's funny how these um, these patterns keep playing out, and even the most educated of the black females, uh, when you present the pattern in front of them, and they 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 drop it like it's a, uh, you know, drop it like the vampires running from holy water. I mean, somebody's got to take accountability and responsibility for this. Yes. I mean, we'll put we'll put it this way. Mm-hmm. Just like I was telling Chaos Reign, mm-hmm. the the secular institutions of this country are not going to care for your children and to ensure their welfare like you can. Yeah. They, they just won't. They, they can't. It's th- these institutions are too large and too impersonal to be tailor made for your own children's success. And mm-hmm. there, there's a brother in here who says uh, 24 tribes. He says, look, there are plenty of public high schools in America that are some of the biggest feeders to the top 20 universities, Ivy's included. Mm-hmm. And that may be the case in some you know areas or districts mm-hmm. where the tax bases or, 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 or you know, or, or higher, and uh, you know the the neighborhoods are more wealthy, and there's more social capital there. But mm-hmm. I mean, come on, man! Like you're talking about kids in Chicago, yeah, g- getting a good education at a public school. Chicago, St. Louis, Baltimore, Washington D.C., Miami, Atlanta, Los Angeles. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The list goes on. Uh, Memphis, Tennessee. I could, you know, I could just keep on naming city after city after city held new orleans louisiana i mean i could shreveport louisiana i can just name city after city after city you know when uh nationally only 10 percent of your uh, black boys in eighth grade can read a reading level okay and that's that's not a social crime i don't in a in, a, in an advanced uh, country like this i don't get it i don't get well, it well i mean the, the, well you you get it Mm-hmm. I get <laughs> you it. Underst- you get it. Uh, get you it. understand it. Yeah. Uh, but 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 black folks have handed over education ever since desegregation. Black folks handed over education. It, but, but the thing is, is that um, even before, before desegregation, right? Um, it was re- only like a quarter of your black boys ever made it past eighth grade. Ever, you know, a quarter of your men ever made it past eighth grade. In fact, most of them. Uh, didn't make it past sixth grade, and that was in the 1960s, where where women were the, your women. Uh, in fact, Monahan said in his report, 75 um, percent of your valedictorian is any high school uh, nationally were, were always female. You know, uh, it, the three quarters of uh, of an HBCU was always female. This is not new. They just don't talk about. It. In fact, there's one woman that argued against it until she went back and remembered her days at HBCU in the '60s, you know, in the '70s, and she she had to stop for a second. She remembered the, the stuff that's going on now was going on back then. You know, the thing is, it's just always been ignored. And then when they when they they find out the statistics, they kind of sweep it under the rug. Yeah, it's I mean, just, in other words, you're just some dumb Negroes. <laughs> uh, well, they, well, they they I don't know if they. I think they believe that black men as a whole are inadequate. I think so too. Yeah. And, and, and that's just the way it is. That's just nature. And, uh, so, so, so they don't pour resources into the, uh, into the black males. And when they, when you have something like, say, um, we have something like an all boys school or you have something like a, my brother's keeper. I think black women believe that those resources are wasted on black boys. You know, inherently, I don't think they I think it's, you know, it's logically, but inherently, I think in the back of their minds, they think, why are you wasting uh, all this money on on, on men or, or males that won't amount to anything? Yeah, uh, I, I think you're right about that. Yeah. Um, and, and look, this society has so many damn traps and pitfalls set up and established for black men. It's ridiculous, mm-hmm. man. Yeah. So even if you can overcome the odds and you can become literate. Yeah. 
and you can become accomplished, there's still something after that waiting to try to pull you back down. Yeah, yeah. Cause, and, cause, and this is a crazy system, man. Because we, we even argue, man, because, you know, Art New Style is, you know, he's a he, he's a professor and he's an art professor and he's a high school teacher. And he constantly argues this point, man. You can't b- believe even educated black women saying that you don't that black boys don't need higher education at all. They should you know, focus on trade, focus on a trade, focus on a, focus on a skill where they can get make money doing that. Which I which I have no problem with. I mean, you're a skilled tradesman, so I mean, even you you don't have any problem with that. You make a lot of money, can make a very good living being a skilled tradesman. You know, uh, but the thing is. It's, it's, I believe that all all children, all black children should be educated to the greatest extent possible. So no matter what they choose to do, they'll be able to do it. That's just my opinion. I said you shouldn't just write off, you know, half of your half of your uh, of your of your culture or half of your race, you know, to, to use the vernacular just because you don't believe they should be educated or it's, it's a or education is wasted on them. It's just it's just bizarre to me. Yeah, that's bizarre to me too. Especially if you know the, these are educators who are saying this. Yeah, yeah, uh, I've, I've, heard, I've heard educated, I've heard educated women say this. Women that are that are conservative and and whatnot. And I heard them that, that so why should they? Uh, why should we try to send black boys to college? And and I said, you know, my thing is, regardless of whether they go to college or not, going to higher education should be their choice. But they should be prepared to go, uh, no matter what. They should be they should be college ready, whether they go or not. True indeed, true indeed. That's why I believe. But uh, look, I I know, man. I you know I went to an all black college and uh, it was eight to one, the ratio. Oh, really? I mean, really? Get out of here, man! I ain't lying. I'm not lying, bro. It wasn't no. It, it'd be different if it was uh, cause what what what's what's eight to one, in terms of a percentage. Eight to uh, one, it, it's about uh, it's about twelve percent. Eight to one, bro. Yeah, that's about that's that's twelve to uh, one. Yeah, it, 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 that's twelve percent. Only twelve percent of HBCU is male. Oh, oh, that's, that's insane. At the, at the time that I went there, yeah, that's insane. And uh, you know, it's just so many women. I mean, just they're everywhere. And uh, yeah. you know, the brothers, man, are just trying to figure a way to make it through. Uh, some of the brothers were just super bright um, and, and gave the women a run for their money. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you know how guys are, man. We, uh, you know. Yeah. Some well, some of us struggle. You know, some of us struggle. Uh, it, 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 that's the whole thing. Is that um, um, the reason that they struggle? Well, you know, man, because you came up. You know how it is. Because you went to a a, a decent high school. Uh, preparation before you get to college, man. College is not a place you should, you need to be in if you're not prepared to go. If you haven't prepared uh, through middle through at least from ninth grade on up, man, you get to college, man, you're gonna get overwhelmed because because you're supposed to be there to uh, go to the next level. And if you if you're still struggling on the basics, man, it's gonna be hard for you. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, look, all I can say is, man, I, I was prepared for college, uh, you know, but I, I've been, you know, I've been reading all my life, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I started off early, you know, uh, as a reader, I, you know, I'm mm-hmm. avid reader, man. That's all I did as a youngster yeah. was read, yeah. read, read, read. But, uh, you know, my mother did the same, though. You know, yeah, it wasn't yeah. like. Uh, I, I was I was an anomaly in my uh, in my family. Right. Uh, out of five out of five kids and two adults, I was I was the only reader. And that's, that's, that's crazy. it was just it's just something I always wanted to do. I just took to it like a duck to water. And so uh, like when my mother, you know, you know, when they get paid, they they buy you little toys or little trinkets to make you happy. Right. I was asked for a book. I was the only one, I, you know, so I was really the only reader in my family. And, and at least until like until we got to uh, higher grades. But as a little boy, I was the only reader. So I was crazy. an anomaly. Crazy, but what do you? Okay, so my my next question for you, BGS, is uh, what do you think about this whole notion of uh, Protestant work ethic and uh, how black people, uh, you know, fail to exemplify it? And uh, uh, well, you know, uh, this goes back to environment, right? Um, if uh, if you don't have a Protestant work ethic in Northern Europe, you, you're probably going to die because uh, 
because the, the, the because the environment weeds you up. Say if you don't if you weren't work hard enough, and that crop fails, then you're probably going to starve to death or come close to it. And if you come if you survive it, you're not going to do that the next time. So a Protestant work ethic, you know, the, the the Germanic Protestant work ethic that you need to survive in that in that environment is necessary. You don't this like you don't see that in Latin America. You don't see that in Africa, right? Because like you said, you got five growing seasons a year in uh, on the continent, right? Because you're close to the equator and the soil is a lot better. The hard ass soil and that in that in that uh, that sun that only shines what uh, at best uh, five months out of the year, you know, on, on a regular basis. If you don't uh, if you don't get that one or the one or two crops in, man, um, you're gonna start that. That's gonna be hard winter. You're gonna be eating each other. So, uh, so you have to work very hard. You have to constantly work and build and toil. Because that's what the because you live in a harsh environment, so that's where that's where it comes from. Um, uh, which is a Mountain Gladwood talked about the the, the, the cultures right of, of the, that's exemplified by the food that you eat uh, uh, in in um, in a rice culture right to grow rice is really really difficult right so you have to work fourteen hours a day to to actually uh, cultivate rice. So that's where their their work ethic comes to, but it's nothing like the European because the Europeans have to be. They come from a very harsh climate, man, a very harsh environment, and so uh, anything that doesn't work hard, anything that, that doesn't struggle like that, won't survive. Yeah, I've heard I've heard this. You know this. You know the the ice theory. You know. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know the the, uh, the cold climate theory. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh, well. you, you can see how, how how it would shape how your mentality or your culture. Not necessarily, uh, I don't believe that it's genetic, but but I, but I do believe that it's uh, that it, it will actually shape your culture. See, the Russians are even harsher than the uh, than the, uh, the Europeans, but uh, uh, we call it CP time, like on the continent, and they and in Latin America they call it manana time, right? Same thing, exact same thing. Where it's laid back, it's not precise. Uh, they work hard, but they don't. They don't. It's not as uh, continuous as uh, as Europeans. Yeah, they don't go out of the way to uh, demonstrate their fitness yeah. by means of the work that they do. Yeah, uh, they, they have time where they can just chill and relax and uh, yeah. Yeah. take time off. I mean, even like in other parts of of Europe, man, they have like four day work weeks mm -hmm. instead of five day work weeks. Mm -hmm. But we yeah. got to show that we're we're ready to go. Like you got to demonstrate that you're yeah. ready to work. And, yeah, they, 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 in other words, when you're working, you have to be, you have to concentrate on working. There is no goofing off or play time or water cooler time. When you work those four days a week, you I mean whatever hours you're in, you work. You know, and 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 that's how come it got passed. Like it got passed down that uh, work is a virtue. You know, work is a for hard work and and sacrifice is a virtue in, in the European ethic. So you think black people ever come to adopt this kind of ethic? I mean, uh, you know, I, I, is it just not fitting with, you know, our, our epigenetic memory? I think that. But, uh, the, but, but before you answer that question, okay. our thing about it to me is, though, if they have this is the dilemma to me about this. Right. Mm -hmm. If they're so fucking hardworking, mm -hmm. what do they need slaves for? I mean, why didn't the indentured servants just get to work and get it done? I mean, they love work. I mean, you know, they that's what they do. It, it's it's a it's a couple things in the north. Uh, in the north, that's going to need as many slaves. But in the south, uh, you got to remember the uh, in the south, uh, the south is the, the south has been terraformed. It, it you but because you know you live you live near Houston, right? Somewhere swamp, around there, yeah. right? It's a swamp, man. And, and 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 even even it being a swamp, that's how come we have all the levees and drainage ditches and all that kind of stuff to drain that water off. Those are all built by slaves. Okay, go back a couple hundred years when it was just bare land. Okay, uh, white people couldn't survive in that environment. They couldn't. You know, Native Americans couldn't work in that environment. They couldn't. The only the only group of people that could work in that environment and survive were African slaves. Point blank period. That's like um uh, they brought them to the uh to the sugarcane uh, fields in uh in uh, uh in in basically in Haiti and Jamaica and uh in, in places in Cuba because uh sugarcane is very harsh. It needs a lot of water. Same thing with rice. It needs a lot of water. It needs a lot of labor. You have all kind of pests and stuff like that in that swamp. And only only people that can survive that environment are black people. That's how come they brought them. 
they were never brought because it's because compared to uh enslaving natives uh, black people are very expensive comparatively but the thing is it's necessary because they're the only ones that could do two things one survive european diseases and surprise survive that harsh environment we call the uh, call a swamp because the south the south from now north carolina uh, i think it's maryland on down with swamp you know in the south that's all swamp or the swamp or desert and uh in in and white people could not survive that environment they couldn't because they, they they readily died. In fact, the uh, the some of the slave owners they left, you know, for during certain times of year. Even, even Washington D.C. before it was it got modernized, right? Okay, there was during the summertime they had to leave, man, because they couldn't survive that summer. So <laughs> they made I'm us curious. survive that summer and still work, pick some What's cotton, yeah. plant some uh, plant some uh, yeah some tobacco. Yeah, yeah, and e- even then, even then, black people are expendable. Because, like I said, uh, the sugarcane fields, the average lifespan on the sugarcane field for a, for a black slave was like six years before you had to replace them. In fact, they had it down to a point where they knew uh, how much money to borrow to buy a slave and how much return they were actually going to get, rate of return they would get on that slave on the sugarcane field. And they said that the estimate was like five, five and a half to six years before, before them to turn a profit enough to go back and buy another slave and do it all over again and still make a profit on top of that. That's how that's how precise it actually was. Yeah, well, I don't know, man. I'm just, you know, the only the only reason I did this show was because these guys said they wanted to understand Max Weber. Yeah. Uh, you know, his idea about the Protestant work ethic, mm-hmm. uh, the way that it came about, uh, you know, because these people feel like uh, they're anxious. They have no sign that, you know, they're actually being favored by God. And so the yeah. only way that they could demonstrate that it, is through the work it, that they do. Through hard work. Uh, it, 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 basically, you know, um, um, any any time of ethos that you need to survive in an environment, right, um, culturally wise, it will get, it, it eventually get woven into your religion. You know, even, every place you see it, um, if you if you go back to the, to the rules that they put down and then you take yourself back to where that where that uh, idea might have originated and take you back to self back to that environment you you know I, uh, w- one jewish guy i was actually you know uh, reading he was actually he was jewish he was actually doing barbecue pork right uh pulled pork right he says why is the jewish guy actually he said why is the jewish guy actually eating pork when it's when it's against his religion he said back when the jewish religion was actually um and you guys can you guys can actually jump on in just because I'm talking you don't have to jump yeah, on. Yeah, you can jump in, man. You, you can jump in. Yeah, we just chopping it up. Me and the doc just chopping it up. Um, but he was saying that um, when the Jewish religion was actually formulated, okay, pork had a lot of uh, had had a lot of parasites. So if you caught a even today, if you catch a wild, uh, uh, they don't actually uh, even even uh, say like in Texas when they actually hunt down those feral hogs, they can't eat them. Because they're full of parasites and they're not safe to eat, and our bodies are not used to those kind of parasites. So back then, uh, uh, pork had a lot of parasites. So they banned, uh, uh, they actually made a, a rule or a law and built into a religion to not eat pork. Okay, now pork they they're in a sanitized condition. They 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 full of, they pump them full of antibiotics to kill parasites and stuff like that. So pork is not the same pork that they ate back then. But there's reasons why they they weave in certain um ethos you know in, into religion yeah so, so everything has a purpose i mean you know, everything, religion everything is a, a function of it's uh, a function yeah it's a function of what's going on environmentally in your exactly. culture exactly everybody had some form of ten commandments you know to to survive in an environment yeah i you know i the only thing that you know that gets me man is uh you know Black folks got a hell of a struggle ahead, man. And uh, they think things are going to get better, man. I, I, I assume that things are going to get worse. And, and and the reason I say this is because, uh, you know, I we just did this show on financialization yesterday. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't get a lot of clicks and views because, you know, no. uh, we're, we're worried about <laughs> the opposite it's, sex, I guess. Well, I, yeah, I, don't, I don't know. It's, it's more entertaining, okay. You know, YouTube is part of entertainment, right? But the thing is, is that I know why you do. I know why I do it. You know, I'm laying a foundation for something else. So, and some some videos it has to be foundational, okay. You have to lay a foundation because you're gonna, you know, you're a teacher. You have to build on it. So, some things you have to uh, explain because you're gonna explain. It. You're actually gonna build on it later. 
So I yeah. understand. That's why these videos are necessary. And that's why I wanted to do it a long time ago, but I, I didn't do it. I, you know, I, I see you talking about economics from time to time yeah. in the economy, the market and so on and so forth. But I, I kind of steer away from it because the way that I'll approach it, I'll, you know, sometimes it'll be painstaking. It, you know, I'll take them through too much abstraction and then, they'll you know, they'll be off put by it. And, uh, you know, I'll start using graduated terms and then people will be like, what the hell? But the thing is, is that uh, and, and this has come from. um my subs right uh you try to mix it in so the terms and the terminology and they don't know that they need it until they meet somebody that's in that field and when they start talking that person's language then it's it's we give them keys to open up doors so you give them a name or you give them a a, a, a an idea or you give them a, a theory and yeah, with with a certain key terms then they can unlock the knowledge of that person because okay that you know, okay that person is speaking my language. Say uh, I know a friend of mine. He's a uh, he works for the airlines. But thing is, he dated two economists just by the work that I've done and stuff that I've told him, and then books that I've told him to go read. Now he can actually go to that you know go to a PhD economist and actually talk her language or speak her language because you 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 be, have been introduced. To it, and well, that's what you're doing. You're introducing people to a higher level or a different way of thinking. Because nobody, because um, I don't show it like you show it. Because um, I show it from a from a economic practical standpoint. But I, but you do it by the groundwork philosophy of, of economics. And philosophy, uh, economics is philosophy. You know, most of the econ ec ec uh, economists, or what we think of uh, economists, thinkers are actually philosophers. Like Marx is a philosopher. He's not an economist. True. This is true. And and and, we, and unless you know philosophy, you really can't get into the mind of what Marx actually meant. Now he's using an economic term, but he's really talking philosophy. Correct, uh, Eon. Would you like to? I know you've been kind of checked out for a second. Would you like to add anything? Um. Yeah, man. Um. This is a good discussion, man. The internet man here in Atlanta. I don't know what the hell's going on. They either targeting they either marking certain uh youtubes or whatever to give it trouble i don't know but my thing is with the protestants and the calvinists so you said the calvinists they believe in the predestination so that means to some degree that they were involved in the belief of the caste system and so on and so forth you also had the protestants part of their uh their coming up you know uh you know their, their protest was that they were able to educate themselves. So then you got the priest, the priest class, you know, or the educated class, you know. Uh, so so therefore, because they couldn't uh, get their work respected, you know, but, you know, because for the most part, you know, they were serfs and so on and so forth. They were able to come up through the uh, the uh, aristocracy through education. So anytime there's a decline in work, education becomes the new gate, the new gatekeeper. Um, so, that, you know, therefore, it would be automatic that uh, black men would be pushed aside from education because that's going to be the determining factor of, 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 of class and wealth. And in, in a lot of cases, going back to that, uh, that, that, that historical precedent. OK, well, so we got a whole bunch of people that just jumped in. Uh, the truth, go ahead and speak to us, man. Say, say something to us, man. Let us know something. Okay, well, the truth is not ready. Uh, Herb Saint, what's going on? Talk to us, man. <laughs> Somebody talk to us. Not not everybody at one time. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> right, not everybody at in. one time. But you joined the, you joined the panel for a reason. So I, I, was quiet, I, was, I was quiet because I wanted everybody else to get in. BJS, you scared everybody off, man. You scared. Everybody. I don't. Gigi's a smart one in the bunch. You know, he talked about me. Gigi, intimidates people just by the by his icon, by his avatar, man. That's crazy, man. That this damn gorilla got my, got him shook, huh? You see, yeah. people, people, the people show up for debate and run off, man, with Gigi. <laughs> Man, they stopped my stream in midstream, bro. Like, what? What is that, man? Yeah, he, oh, because if 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 uh, if you pay play too much of a copyrighted material, so called copyrighted material, they will stop it and they give you a warning. Yeah. Okay, so they they didn't give me a strike then. Oh, man. No, they didn't give you a strike. No. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and cut out, you know, most of the stuff that I got there. And I, uh, yeah, that's why. That's why instead of. Uh, 
in, instead of showing the video, yeah, uh, I you know, play the audio. Okay. And, and then because you, the, the 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 artificial well, the AI won't pick up the uh, won't pick up the audio the same way you, if you strip if you strip it from a video. Right, but you know, I I just find it odd that people would want to uh, copyright educational material to begin with. Uh, uh, it's one thing uh, to, uh, you know, not want somebody to take your entire, you know, uh, document and uh, play it unadulteratedly, you know, just play the, the bulk of it without commenting on it. But I guess, you know, content creators, man, uh, I guess if they put copyrighted protection on their own videos, it would do the same thing. huh? Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's weird because the, the dealing with the copyright is weird uh, with YouTube because you never know exactly uh how you because it's so fickle there's nothing straightforward about how they do anything oh i was muted on the com oh my, my, just, bad guys. my bad that's why i was muted on my computer i was okay i was okay i, I was talking but y'all couldn't hear me but what i was what i was just saying before is uh i just been enjoying the con uh the conversation of uh financialization and basically the devalu devaluing of the currency and stuff that's really interesting and i actually find that uh quite frustrating to be honest and quite concerning for the uh coming future yeah that's like um uh that's like um bankers have been um bankers have been uh hated throughout eternity you know Gigi can tell you that bankers have a bad name uh and and, and basically um fractional reserve banking is even worse right because what it do it will slowly start stripping the value from from the economy because they they, they, they take a off piece, the top yeah they, they, they skim a little piece of it you don't notice it at the beginning but as it goes along a little a little further, over further time further, it just yeah, adds it, starts up. To, it starts to erode the, the value of the economy but the, the only thing that i'm confused about with when it comes to americans right uh, -huh. uh, uh -huh. especially middle class americans uh-huh I mean, there's so much wealth inequality in this country. Uh, you know, the, the rich are uber rich. Mm -hmm. uh, the middle class is shrinking and yeah. poor people are getting poorer than they've ever been before. It, right. it, it might not seem like that. Yeah. Uh, because it's, it's like being a frog in a boiling pot. Right. You know, uh, we don't notice it. We don't really observe it. But, but I mean, there was yeah. there was a struggle. Uh, you know, called the Occupy Wall Street, but then it just fell. It just collapsed. They, they, they paid them off, man. That, that started happening. I said, I knew they were going to do it. The, the people, the smart people like you that would lead the struggle, okay, uh, they're going to pay them off. Okay, okay, you're out here because you, you're protesting, uh, you're leading this protest. In other words, the leaders, the smart ones, the so-called alphas, um, they're going to find out who they are, identify them. And then uh, one day you can get an offer to work on, on a, at a corporation or a, a at a, a startup or something like that. And if you and say no, it, well, you can stay out and be poor, you know, <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> I mean, and, 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 as, smart, as smart as Gigi is, and as dedicated as he is, Gigi likes to eat. Okay. Hmm. And and Gigi, you know, if, if Gigi's out there a leading protest, ain't too many Gigi's going to turn down a hundred thousand dollar a year job true i mean that's the I, dilemma you know of activism in and of itself you know mm -hmm. uh you know a lot of people uh you know they yeah. start off with good intentions but then they you know uh yeah. but, but it all depends on how uh you know dedicated you are to the ideals and yeah. you know yeah. uh philosophy that you uh you know <laughs> you're active you're activists about you're you not know? gonna get all of them but you're gonna get a majority yeah yeah I, you know it's you know Hey, that but money, Gigi, man, you know, that, hey, that money, maybe, man. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. So, Ian. so you know, um, to to back, back so so back to where you're talking to against uh, about the process and the, and the Calvinists. So go back to because I was saying in the chat, I was saying that at, at um at one point, and, and they still do. The British saw themselves as the. Uh, as the descendants of the children of Israel. So in 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 case where you go back to, while saying to you go back to the uh, uh, the curse that was placed on the ground to to the point to where we have to tell it if they have uh, saved themselves, right? And they're the chosen people, then automatically they see somebody else that out 
outside that salvation as those who, who were uh, cursed, predestined to till the ground. Okay, so uh, then, so then, then you have a situation where, okay, where they come to America. Well, okay, they're gonna. Well, you're breaking up, brother. I, you know, you're, 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 you're working you're, out, brother. You got a bad connection. Yeah, so you know when he gets his stuff back together, man, we can in interpolate him back in the conversation. Yeah, 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 that's 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 what is sold to the regular people. But you know, when the elite, they work on a completely different principle because they had no problem with uh, Shanghai and white boys. You know, before there was black slaves and and carrying them over to the new world to actually start breaking ground. Uh, there's there's a good book called uh, White Trash, uh, and uh, she breaks that down. They had no problem with uh, uh, using um, white people for fertilizer. You know, to actually break ground and actually develop the uh, develop a country for them as to come over and rule. <laughs> and that's you know that's crazy. You know, uh, th the first people that they threw under the bus was themselves, man. You know, uh, it's a reason why the word slave comes from Slav. <laughs> yep. You know, they they have enslaved themselves. They will do it again if, if oh, need yeah. be. Yeah. You know, uh, but back to the subject at hand, man. Um, I don't know. I, the only reason I wanted to do Calvinism and capitalism as a subject uh, was because a lot of black folks are, are themselves making uh, what I would consider to be Calvinist arguments about poor black folks. Right. Uh, you know, and especially I see this from conservative black folks in the manosphere and elsewhere. So, uh, yeah, but, so called. Yeah. I mean, but the, the idea is that, you know, poor people are poor because they're lazy. Uh, they're not thrifty. They're not industrious. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my whole argument is, man, black folks, man, been tilling the land in America since, you know, <laughs> uh, since the country uh, was founded. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have yet to reap the benefits of uh, full fledged citizens uh, the way well, some you know, other demographics have. You know, and, so, you know, and, and, you know, Gigi, I was saying, too, the NOI, see, a lot of people don't know that the NOI, uh, Farrakhan himself, I seen the speech Farrakhan and Malcolm X. They taught that black people in America were cursed with uh, the, the curse of Ham. All right. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Farrakhan said, you know, that that uh, black people's kinky hair, uh, it should it should be that our hair should should be straight, just like our eyebrows. All right. So so that just goes to show how deeply entrenched <laughs> even within black culture. <laughs> yes. Even Man, within stop black it, culture, dude. No, that yes, that's true. That is true. I, I'll send you to the, the there is a there are two videos of Malcolm and Farrakhan saying that we were cursed, um, even even cursed beyond the Africans themselves. You know, he said that's why we're ugly in a, in in America. That black people are ugly. You know, even more ugly than than the Africans because we we were the specific group that were cursed with the curse of Ham. And so what I'm saying is, even amongst us. This whole caste system and this idea that we are to be slaves, it's it's so ingrained in us, you know. I don't know that it's it's ever it's ever gonna get out to the point to where we can we can even mentally resist the idea that we were meant to be slaves. Uh, yeah, that is that is part of uh, the indoctrinated caste system that you suffer from. Um uh and, and that's why um the only way the only way to undo this uh, is pull all your black children from from uh white uh, controlled schools so even though there's a black face in front of the uh in front of the in front of the by the chalkboard right it's still a white dominated system and you're still in still teaching white ideals so it doesn't matter the color of the teacher yeah and and and, and beyond that man you know again if you got both parents going to work and uh, nobody's staying home with the kids, ensuring yeah. that they are learning to the best of their ability. Yeah. Uh, the, first of all, they don't think independently. They think what the school system tells yeah. them to think. Uh, they, they adopt the values. They adopt the values and the principles that they are, are, are told to accept and adopt. So, yeah. I mean, I, this is part of a plan as well. I mean, you know, yeah. black folks, at least when they were segregated, they had the ability to instill their own values inside of their children. Uh now we we giving everything up to these you know uh, these white folks, man. 
I hate to say this, but I mean, you know, it just is what it is. This is what we what we fought for. We fought to be indoctrinated. Well, that's the deal that was struck. You know, we 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 fought to be uh, not abused through the Jim Crow system that we we had been, and that's the deal that was struck. That's the deal that they struck with us. Okay, well, you don't want to be abused. You got to be you got to be assimilated, and uh, that's the deal that was struck. So, uh, I don't in that in that case, I don't know what do you do. You know. Um, because it's a it's a devil's bargain either way. Which 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 one do you take? Well, you need more male teachers for one. Uh, uh, I was I would say if, well, I think I, you know uh, even Monahan said that which 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 baffles me is that the biggest uh, opponents of an all male system for black boys the biggest opponents are black women, which baffles me. Well, you already know the answer to that question. You didn't, you know, we didn't, we've spoken on that topic. I don't know how many times, uh, you know, rather to be uh, a, a queen in hell than to be a servant in heaven. I mean, and not to say that black men will create some sort of heavenly uh, conditions or something like that. But I mean, I mean, the idea is that, I mean, they've become accustomed to being able to do whatever they want and to being unanswerable to anyone. I mean, they, yeah. you don't have to answer to anybody. Uh, yeah. Why not keep it the way it is? You know, I'm gonna uh, let some yeah. other people talk. Uh, you know, I'm gonna let some other people. Yeah, you you got I think you have a super chat though, uh, Gigi. Oh yeah, thank you, my brother uh, Harold George. He says, "Do you keep? Do you think the upcoming GME and AMC short squeeze have finally gotten the Wall Street and the banks into trouble with the government? No more bailouts. Will regular black folks get a win in capitalism?" Uh, okay. GME and AMC short squeezes are basically, uh, uh, because they liberalized, um, they, to get more money in, to actually keep this thing going, they had to find, you know, had to dig deeper and deeper to get money, just like they did with the, uh, with the, uh, f- with the, uh, financial crisis, the housing crisis, right? With the mortgage crisis, they had to, they had to keep digging and digging and get poorer and poorer people. So, uh, short squeezes and stuff that they're doing, it was never really meant to be liberalized like this, right? And um, what it probably will, what, what they what it will do is if they're going to start tightening up the rules because um, uh, those um, those those uh, hedge funds that uh, went went naked like that and uh, and actually uh, bought uh, uh, bought derivatives that actually uh, more than uh, the stock was actually worth or bought the na- the actual uh, stocks out there available stocks out uh, stock certificates out there. Um, they got themselves in trouble. They have been doing that for a very long time. The thing is, uh, if it's a closed system, they can do it. They can get away with it. But an open system, especially through the Internet, where you can have uh, p- uh, uh, open trading, trading like Robinhood and uh, all the other apps where the average joke can actually come in and play. That's going to script the system. So uh, what, what, they're ha- what, they're, what they're finding out is you have a whole bunch you know, when you have a. Uh, Smaller players, even though they're smaller, there's still a lot of money and they can come in and actually drive stock up. And and basically, if you're overexposed, like, say, like with with GME and AMC, then um, you're going to get squirrels and there's no way out of it. And and so the what what they're going to have to do after after they clean all this stuff up, because those uh, hedge funds will go out of business. OK, they're going to because they owe way more money than they can actually cover underneath those. uh those short those shorts they can't cover those shorts so they're gonna go out of business but after they go out of business they're gonna really get strict about uh, uh, naked short selling and also uh, how you can actually uh, go in and in and out and buy uh, buy derivatives or or um, options so it's gonna change the way people do options it's, it's gonna get more expensive to actually buy and sell options I, I do believe in the, in the near future because you can't keep driving large hedge fund hedge funds that are worth like 40 20 30 billion dollars out of business because you're going to uh, i think five or six of them are going to get hit and that money has to be made up some kind of way and uh, you can't lose you know three four hundred billion dollars man on a couple of stocks doesn't make sense especially small stock like this because people are doing stupid stuff so they're going to clean all this stuff up um uh they'll, they'll they'll get it straight this is their system and you know the the uh the amateur short sellers they did nothing wrong they played by the rules the thing is is that um when 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 um when when big hedge funds think they can actually do anything and and, and kind of you know uh, stretch the rules uh, uh, stretch near the margins and you got little players that don't play by that game you're going to get hit and that's what they're going to learn a lesson about doing uh, these uh, this kind of exotic stuff 
and they'll clean it up. They'll, they'll, they'll clean it up and uh, uh, they'll get strict because when I like 20 years ago, when I was doing options, man, it was expensive to do options. You couldn't do all this kind of crazy stuff that they're doing um, uh, in, 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 the, in order to make money. You couldn't drive stocks, sorry, drive businesses out of business like that because you're squeezing them like that. So they're going to clean all this stuff up, but which is necessary. I think it should be uh, uh, be more regulated. So the government's going to step in and kind of kind of clean all this stuff up. Uh, you won't be able to make the money that you that you have been on, especially on options. So if you if you plan options, get it while you're getting is good because it's going to get very tight in in the very near future. That's what I would say. If that makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, but you know, I, I just don't like short selling in general. I, you know, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> I just don't like the concept. You know, I bet this company's going to fail. So yeah, uh, it's gambling. It's gambling, but it's supposed to be regulated, just like in, in Las Vegas. There's there's limits. There's supposed to be limits on how much you can gamble, how much you can, uh, you know, uh, play without you, without money. There's limits on how how much you can gamble. There's got to be limits on this stuff, and they've stretched the limits, you know, further than. Um, then they should have been stretched. You can't, there's no way you can actually uh, short 140% of total stock. Shouldn't be done. You know, because because that 40% doesn't exist. So if you if you gamble wrong and it goes the other way, you can't even buy enough stock to cover your shorts because it doesn't exist. Right. Uh, you know, but this is just this is what I refer to as the financialization of the economy. Exactly. Man. Exactly. And exactly. uh, you know, uh I Again, th- that's why I did the show yesterday. I know this is just an extension of what I did yesterday mm-hmm. uh, to some degree, but yeah. more foundational, more philosophical, uh, a yeah. little bit more abstract than that. But because uh, yeah, financialization is concrete, you can point to the practices. That, whereas, that, you know, that's why uh, your house. That's why your housing is so high because a lot of these mortgages in these houses are sitting on banks, bank sheets, right? And if the price, the the, the uh, value of these houses go down because you need to build more houses for people, for young people to live in that's affordable, it's going to take the, it's going to lower their the, put these banks into the red. So that's it's not that they can't build houses; they can build plenty of houses. They can house everybody if they want to. But the thing is, it's going to affect the banks if they do. Yeah. That's the financial. That's how the financialization of the economy. Uh, that's what it does to you. You know, now they're making decisions not for uh, for the good of the people, but for the good of of the corporations and and the banks that are holding all this paper. Because, like 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 uh, Gigi said, they're too big to fail. And that's that's the dilemma, you know, uh, because capitalism is supposed to be predicated upon the idea: yeah. if you don't do what you're supposed to do, then you fail. Yeah. That's just what it is. Like Shearson and Lehman Brothers. I mean, you you fail. There's nobody coming to bail you out like they did with General Motors. No bailouts. Yeah. Your business model was insufficient, inadequate, and so therefore, you know, you you get phased out of business. But uh, you know, if you got people who work at GM and they have car loans and mortgages to pay, <laughs> yeah. and then the people who you know pay them, I yeah. mean, you know, who who uh, manage their loans. And who managed, you know, the, the car loans and the house loans. Yeah. You know, if if they can't pay those loans, then they're out of work. I mean, so yeah. it's a cascading effect. A cascading effect. Yeah. But, same but, thing. Same thing that's going on with the with with the uh, uh, with with the uh, COVID thing, right? We're not paying rent and they're not paying mortgage payments, right? Because of the CDC can't put these people out, right? And so all that, all that's all, all the basically, it's a no-win situation for the banks, for the for the landlords, and for the renters, and for the uh, mortgage holders. Well, you it, know, that's the, this, this is the promise that Trump, you know, uh, you know, proposed to the American public to make America great again. It wasn't necessarily to make it white again, but to get American work Americans working again. I mean, that yeah. was his proposal, okay? But yeah. I mean, I th- he knew he knew he couldn't do it, man. E- easier said than done. Um, and I, I think I think you had put something on my uh, I'm going to let everybody else get in. I'm going to shut up in a minute. Um, um, you had put something on my uh, uh, on my comment section about why uh, all this, this stuff got exported to China. Right. Exported to Asia. Right. And I, I remember that. And you, you, yeah, I, re- I remember what you said. Yeah. And uh, and and it, it, it doesn't make sense until you go look at the uh, lawsuits of Silicon Valley. Right. About all the. Uh, 
toxic waste that was actually spilled into in, into the ground, right? And they, it got so toxic that they couldn't even build there. So they needed, if they wanted the, the sector to grow, they had to export it someplace else. So they exported to, to uh, Taiwan, then Korea, and then finally China. And that's so all the advanced technology that would normally be built here and developed here, they couldn't because it's too toxic. In fact, uh, 50 uh, China has a water problem because, like, as, you know, this is years ago. It has to be like maybe 16, 15, 16 years ago. Um, I, I was reading that 52 percent of China's water is polluted because of because of the, the heavy metals and the stuff that, that they put in the water that's runoff from the factories of them developing the silicon chips and, 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 and the stuff that's related to it. So um, that's like a most of your thing, like TVs, TVs ran on chips. So that's like your TVs got exported to Taiwan and, and to, uh, and to uh, into Korea. In fact, all your flat panels and stuff like that and stuff that's related to them, it's easier to build it there because that's where the that's where the chips and all the components are made. You can't you can't build them here. Uh, what what uh, what Trump and, and and even Biden are trying to do, even Biden's trying to do, Biden's trying, Biden's trying to build, uh, 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 bring back like the chip manufacturing and stuff like that back into the United States. That, that's like Arizona is probably going to be big because that's where they're going to start. Uh, building these chip factories because that's one of the probably the safest place places to actually build it out in the middle of the desert somewhere right um uh it is what it is but that's why they shipped it out in the first place they didn't they didn't want to do it but the thing is they had if they wanted that sector to grow and this advanced technology to grow they had this is what they had to do yeah i just think it i, I just didn't think it was smart uh from a uh a national yeah. defense standpoint, you know, it, it, uh, it, it, that, that was just my opinion about it. Uh, it you know. well, it, well, it's true. It, it's true. But the thing is, you, if you can't, if it's too toxic to build here, what do you do? If you wanted to, if you want to develop it, what do you do? You either not develop it or what? You have to export it. Outsource or, or, or insource, you know, right. uh, I, I get it. You yeah. know, I get it. Uh, yeah. But but again, you know, it's that's that's that externality that you never think about. I mean, yeah. you, you know, it's a trade off like it, and, it, and then it, it, gamble. Yeah. And every time you commit an action, you don't know what the unintended consequences of those actions will be, especially if you're, you know, charting new territory. You, you just don't know. Well, it well basically you, for 60 years, man, you got a good 60 year run of uh of this technology i mean you got you know uh, uh, uh guys with that have earned hundreds of billions of dollars from this technology and sooner or later the devil's gonna have to be paid so uh now it's uh it's time to do something else that's like i'm gonna be trying to bring it back in um even your advanced chip it's you know uh tsmc that builds the five nanometer chips for for apple and all that kind of stuff which are the most advanced chips in the world they're trying to get that back here and that basically, and that's that's IBM's technology that that belongs to. That's what they invented, but they had they exported it to the Chinese. Yeah, let them tear up their own ecosystem. Yeah, <laughs> which, which, which 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 the Chinese with the China. Why do you think the the Chinese, especially in in the capital city of Beijing, wear those masks because of the pollution? Yeah, they have an environmental problem, but they were willing to do it to to advance. So they sacrifice, you know. They sacrificed their their ecology to actually uh, to actually advance uh, as far as technological advancement. So uh, I, it's a gamble that paid off for them. Yeah, it's uh, we we benefited from the gamble for sixty years uh, because without that you, you could not have advanced because those chips actually could not be built here. Um, in fact, there's places there you know there's a whole library. In fact, that's what I was you know I, I was I was thinking about doing, man. Just going up to the library in San Jose. Where all the documents, all the they have like hundreds, uh, hundreds of boxes of uh, court documents, of lawsuits, um, uh, uh, in Silicon Valley. Just go through them, man, and maybe like write a book about it because nobody talks about it. I mean, absolutely nobody talks about uh, what happened and why why the, these chips got exported to to Asia. Yeah, that's that would be interesting. You know, uh, that that would be something that that would be very interesting to me. But yeah. you know, all of the new tech. From your cell phone yeah. to your iPad to your laptop to mm -hmm. uh, you know to the speakers that you use now. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything has these you know these chips in them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the question is, you know, uh, well, what what what, what it, from a security standpoint, how vulnerable are you making yourself when you when yeah. you outsource all the, the the fabrication of all this technology and then it comes back to you and you're utilizing it 
I mean, I, I, trust me, they have some discrete systems uh-huh. that they that they use for the for, for their own defense purposes. Mm-hmm. I get that, okay, yeah. but uh, but a lot of it is interconnected, you know, to what they use peripherally in in their personal lives. So, the, so the question is, how can you keep all of this shit secure if you're not the one building and manufacturing it? Uh, you you basically uh, you can't. And yeah, you know, but that's the gamble that you take. Yeah. Hey, it is what it is, man. Uh, you know, I don't uh well we got the brother the truth, man. He came in a little bit earlier, but he you know, I don't know what's going on with the connectivity with you guys, but uh what's up, truth? How you doing? My bad. I'm just going through a little signal difficulties. Um Yeah, and, you sound you sound a little scratchy. That's okay, hold on, let me adjust my that sound better now? Yeah, it sounds better. Okay, there it was a little down. Uh, and basically, what, what? Why do people? What, I mean, re- honestly, what is all this talk about Joe Biden? Like, I'm I'm really confused on why I keep hearing multiple people bring up Joe Biden on, and it just continues to keep happening. Like, what are these? I I honestly like I, a BGS. I, I've asked. I know I've asked you this before, and I've heard you elaborate on it, and it's basically. You know, no. it's it's basically what they expect. They expect this crazy roller coaster. But I mean, I don't. I just don't get the. Well, I, I've never really seen this before, like in my lifetime, with another president. What, well, you're young. You're young. But, it's it's been here before. You're just young. But uh, go ahead and let Gigi expound upon it, because I'm sure okay. he's probably as confused. What do you think, Gigi? Well, the question is, I mean, well, well, Biden about what? Like, I mean, uh, the, or in, the, it's they, just they, in general. They, 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 they had the, the hatred on in the manosphere of Joe Biden. Oh, well, you know, I, my personal view on it is because uh, of his social policies that advance the uh, rights of women. That's that's what I think uh, is the source of the animus. Now, I mean, you know, everything else is just, you know, a justification post facto. That's just my, I mean, that, that's my viewpoint on it. I, if, if I had to hazard a guess, that's what I would think. Okay? Uh, but, I mean, I, you know, I can't say what another person's inward springs are or the motivations for, for their actions and for the animus that they have. I mean, just listen to what they say. But, uh, you know, sometimes everything is not advil, uh, revealed explicitly. But my guess is, is that, uh, you know, Trump offers some promise to you know, bring women down a notch, especially those who, you know, were pushing feminism, uh, who were pushing, uh, you know, just these social programs that, that, that only advance one specific demographic, man. So, uh, that, that's, that's my, my guess. Now I can't, you know, I can't, again, I can't speak to the inward springs of another person's actions. I don't know what makes you, you know, get up and, and move. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, but my guess is that, uh, you know, the, the right at least uh, has traditional family values. They promote those, uh, and ostensibly, you know, they're pushing back. Excuse me, against some of the excesses of the left. But at the same time, the, the question then is, well, how do you trade that off with, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the issues related to race? The other side, because it's like everybody, it's it's like we're heading toward we're heading towards a society of like equity, but it's like there it's it's masked with like a like a face of like equality. Like it's it's really confusing out here. Like it's just a it's a real big mess. Like at times, well, but the, the, the nation doesn't have an identity uh, anymore. Uh, so you know, uh, this is a neoliberal culture, man, where everybody. Uh, and, and it's just it's all negative liberty to the extreme mm-hmm. and, and it's identity politics to the extreme. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the funny thing, when white women declared that they were oppressed, that that opened up room for everybody to talk about their oppression. As far mm-hmm. as I'm concerned, mm-hmm. well, it, it, expound on that. You said that the nation doesn't have an identity anymore. Expound upon that. Well, I mean, you know, just think about World War Two America versus mm-hmm. America now. Mm-hmm. Okay, and uh, the value system and the ethos of America and its identity nationally uh, is 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 along a, a, a host of dimensions 
uh, of, of institutions in the society. I'm talking about an economic, you know, of uh, identity, a, you know, a familial identity, a social identity. Um, just so you're talking about social, political and economic identities. And, 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 and I think there was some more cohesion then than there is now. Even if the cohesion, you know, was was predicated upon uh, animosity, at least we know, <laughs> you know, what the animosities were all about. But now you got you, it's, it's this identity politics game, man, has, has uh, you know, put even people who are oppressed at odds with each other. So we don't even know who's who's oppressed anymore. Anybody can declare themselves to be oppressed now. So now you got fat people talking about uh, talking about their oppressed. And and fatness is, is to me is indicative of, of overabundance. <laughs> it's just as far as I'm concerned. So that's why that's why you know I, that's why I say what I got. You know that that we don't have any clear identity anymore. Okay, right? let me ask you, let me ask you this question, Doc, because you brought up something about uh, 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 fat people thinking that they're oppressed. Uh, is this an extension of intersectional? Uh, Feminism just kind of expanded out to include everybody. Um, you, you in, know, in a sense. Well, l let me just say this. So, from a philosophical standpoint, here's the the primary issue with uh, identity politics, right? Just so you understand it, okay? Uh, it's about recognition. So it's the politics of recognition. That's what the identity politics is all about: being recognized, being acknowledged as being valuable. OK. Uh, and so. Everybody, you know, can point to some particular instance in which they're not recognized or a reason for which they're not recognized. Right. So at first it was blacks. Right. Then it went from blacks to women. But I mean, blacks and women have always, especially black men and, and white women have always been in this, you know, this struggle for acknowledgement and. uh and it's primarily due to, you know, white men's uh, uh, understanding of who deserves what and what ranking and positioning, you know, one or the other will occupy. Right. Uh, but then it, it began to splinter and, and, and fracture. So so it, at first it was the white black thing. Then it became the the white woman thing. Then it became the black woman thing. Then it became a black lesbian woman thing. And now it's a black lesbian woman with who's overweight thing and 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 now it's it, it's it's a black lesbian woman who's overweight who can't see thing i mean it it just yeah. it's it's expanding is to to the point to where you know everybody wants to be recognized in ways that you know i, I think that it just belies the the reality of of, of especially black men's lives like just take a fat lesbian white woman, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you think a woman like that doesn't have more social advantage culturally, network wise, education wise, I mean, and, and wealth wise than a black man. Mm. I yeah. mean, it's, it's, but, but people use these multiple identities in order to demonstrate that, you know, they're not being recognized. And, but, but here's the deal about recognition. Mm hmm. Nobody's obligated to recognize or to, to, to recognize your 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 value or, or, to some degree. Like there's a limit to point to the point at which you can't be disrespected, right? Mm -hmm. So for me not to disrespect you is one thing, but for me to lionize you, to acknowledge and recognize your value and your worth is a, is another matter altogether. I don't like nobody has the right to be recognized. Like I don't have to make you my friend. Mm -hmm. I don't have to put you on a pedestal. I don't have to, right? Like, think about a Lizzo. This is a person who wants to be acknowledged as beautiful, even if they're not, even if she's not beautiful. I mean, mm. facially, she's a good looking woman, but bodily, she's just not good looking. Mm -hmm. But they're going to make you acknowledge or recognize the value in that mm. because recognition is what they're looking for. So, so, so bringing it back full circle. So, is this the opposite of Calvinism? Is this the opposite of, uh, of the work ethos? I don't think it has anything to do with the work ethos at all. 
Okay. Uh, uh, you know, the, you're talking about apples and oranges there, right? Okay. So, so All right. A, 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 a work ethic is, you know, so there's there could be an ethos surrounding a multitude of, of, of various things, mm-hmm. but 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 here we're talking about an ethos in which you have to acknowledge the value, the inherent worth of that kind of body. Okay. Like, I I don't see why like that's like saying that I have to value jazz over hip hop. Well, because because if say uh, let's say somebody like uh, Lizzo, uh, in in the religious order or the religious system, she would that would be uh, one of the deadly sins, right? Uh, which is uh, what, sloth. What is sloth, yeah. She'd be the example of sloth. Yeah, um, well, um, I don't think she's that far gone, but I mean, she's portly. Uh, let's let's not. I mean, she, <laughs> the gluttonous. <laughs> You've seen the shows where it gets you've seen sloth to the point where like people yeah. can't move. Okay, oh, yeah, they can't move. Where yeah. they're bedridden. I, I've seen the television shows where you know that the doctors like, look, you can't eat anymore. You, you know? yeah. <laughs> if you eat another bite, you're going to explode and then you're, yeah. you're going to die. Okay, uh, she's not at that point, right? She can get out and perform and still, you know, be yeah. somewhat active. Okay. Um, and everybody who's the weight that she is is not morbidly obese. Okay, uh, some people are just bigger than others, right? Yeah. Uh, now it's one thing to be acknowledged as you know, not someone not discriminating against you, and not allowing you to enter the marketplace, or mm-hmm. not allowing you to be able to go to a, a school or a public space. That's one thing, right? But mm-hmm. acknowledging your beauty. Mm-hmm. That's a whole different matter altogether. That's crazy to me. Like, okay, so put it this way. I saw a post on uh, one of my uh, Facebook friends, uh, you know, on uh, on his page or whatever, you know, his thread. And this shit was the most weird shit ever to me. So, okay, so you, there's, a ph- there's a phenomenon in our culture called trans. I'm sure everyone is aware of this, right? Okay, so now you have trans men. Okay, and that that is a woman who has transitioned into being a man who is, for the sake of recognition, asking for men to sit down and urinate so that that doesn't make them feel uncomfortable, that they have to go to the bathroom and urinate as men. I'm like, dude, I'm... It's one thing for me to discriminate against you and to make your life hard and to say you can't come into my establishment you can't buy a home uh you you know you can't did i say school or i mean like you can't hold an office it's one thing to say that it's another thing to say in order to make me feel valuable you have to do a certain set or perform a certain set of actions such that i will feel better that it's too, it's too it, it's it take you're taking it too far Okay, so there's a difference between recognition and rights. And and this distinction, I think, you know, is being blurred now because people are thinking they have the right to recognition. That 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 is a woman's purview because what's important to her? Recognition and attention. Well, hey man, you know, uh th- this is why Man, I I don't want to sound like an absolute misogynist, but th- th- these are th- these are some of the reasons why you know, people early on were like skeptical of women being ushered into social equality and political equality with men, because a lot of people knew that there are certain privileges and a certain set of behaviors and expectations that women have that don't really coincide or co-align nicely and tightly with, you know, social and political equality among men. Right. So uh, this is the one of the reasons why I think women, you know, especially women who come into this space like the woman who did the other day. You know what I mean, she came in here, you know, it, it, it was almost the, you know, the, it's overstepping to demonstrate that, you know, you're going to acknowledge me. Yes. Yes. You're going to acknowledge and recognize, you know, my womanhood. So you're not going to gang up on me and tell me to shut the fuck up because <laughs> I'm a woman. I'm a so woman, you're going to recognize my womanhood. Mm-hmm. But, but here's the dilemma with this. At the very self same time that you're demanding social and political equality, you're demanding at the same time that I still recognize your womanhood. You, for the most part, destroy womanhood. Mm. 
and the privileges associated with it. I mean, even the first feminists, they said this, right? Even in the Combahee River Collective, they're like, don't put us on a pedestal. Mm, yeah. Do not pedestalize us. All we want to do is be treated as equals. So then you begin to treat them as equals. Well, then, okay, well, you're being too dominant. You're being too toxic. Uh, and, and uh, this is the dilemma to me. <laughs> I mean, it is, you know. Uh, it, 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 it's uh, it's uh, nature versus nurture, which is one's going to win out. Uh, uh, how you brought up, how what you think, how you acculturated, or your biology. So well, you have, yeah, well, you know, women are women. Uh, I've always known this man. Women are violent, just like men are. Okay, yeah. but they're violent yeah. in different ways, and they're pernicious in different ways. I, yeah. I don't know what the fuck inspire women to you know well I, we'll put it this way it, it's not what inspire women but it, it inspire an entire culture to accept the yeah. idea that all perniciousness comes from one subset of human beings yeah i just I, I all you got to do is look around and see evil everywhere enacted by every fucking body to understand that the shit doesn't have one locus of one source, I just, I just don't, I, I don't get. I, I'm befuddled by it. I just, mm. I can't comprehend it. Like the other day, I also saw, uh, and I think I might do this tomorrow. Uh, there was some quotes from Bell Hooks where mm. she had, uh, you know, talked about how women can also be patriarchal. Uh, and, yeah. But we talk yeah. about that as well. We talk about like there's a female patriarchy in the black community, and it's called <laughs> the gynocracy, right? Gynocracy, yeah. It is. But 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 why call it a patriarchy? Why not call it like okay, this is females like exemplifying power in in a way that is negative, like in well, a way this this, this vicious because that's the only thing you can compare it to. Because it's nothing because a matriarchy is is not the opposite of a, a patriarchy. It's not. It's a it's a different form. It's it's it's, it's actually a socialize a different way so a gynocracy or a female patriarchy that's the only that's the only thing left where where uh you have ultimate ownership of of, of the members underneath you that's a patriarchy but but, patriarchy. but here's my issue yeah. though yeah. here's my issue so i don't mm -hmm. have a problem with the gynocracy or mm -hmm. the terminology associated with the gynocracy mm -hmm. the only problem i have and is comparing every malevolency related to the abuse of power Mm -hmm. To patriarch, to fathers, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the rule of fathers is what they're talking about. As yeah. if the rule of mothers is somehow beneficent yeah. and uh, you know supremely benign, yeah. just in virtue of the fact that a mother is there. Like I just don't fucking get that. Like who who came up with the idea that no malevolency stems or emanates uh -huh. from femininity? Like I I just don't understand that. These are human beings. Mm -hmm. Just like anybody else is a fucking human being. Mm -hmm. They can lie. Yeah. They can deceive. They can kill. Just like anybody else can. Like how many women have killed men this year? Yeah. Kill men. <laughs> kill men. Kill their children. You know. Uh, kill each other. So it's uh, in fact uh, what we're noticing, you know, with the with this example is that uh, female violence is far more unchecked than male violence. It's not even acknowledged as violence in a lot of instances, mm -hmm. right? So, but but the only thing, okay. So the only issue I have is mm -hmm. for 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 somebody to to basically reduce pathology to patriarchy. To me, that's that's not even an accurate assessment of of pathology in the human species. And and the only reason I think this is done, excuse me. There's a philosophical reason for it. I, you know, I, I'll articulate it as best as I can. <laughs> okay, so we, we don't have a culture that, that knows how to perceive universality as multiplicity. I, think, I know you can understand this, mm -hmm. all right? Because, okay, like, th think about the gods, okay, or a pantheon of gods. Those are universals or forms of being that aren't can't be reduced to one one universal notion of being itself. OK, so like think about Isis or Horus or a Saul or Set or Sekert or, you mm -hmm. know, these are different manifestations of being. 
and they 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 manifest in the world in different ways and they they aren't just personalities associated with human psychology i mean they actually are real like mm-hmm. animals have eros <laughs> they do okay uh also animals have uh setian faculties or, or whatever the case may be or mm-hmm. Pan associate if if you want to go to Greek pan like qualities and then they also have you know uh, wisdom type faculties you know and, and they're represented that way in, in comedic culture so but but here what we do is we like to to abstract away from everything and find out the universal in everything and then point to one locus for it I mean but that's that that's the I think the sin of Greek philosophy. You know, uh, the abstraction away from uh, more and more from different modes of being and then to to reduce everything to one form of being. You even see it in Christian theology. Mm -hmm. But that's my I I know it's difficult for me to express this, but. Even feminine gods could do some terrible things in the pantheon of gods of other different cultures. Mm -hmm. They have witches and, and evil women and they, they're, man, they're represented in the culture. Mm-hmm. So you're able to understand and to acknowledge, okay, women can do some fucked up shit. Okay? But in this culture, all you got is God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah. you, when you want to you, you start talking about theology, you yeah. know, but you do have, you know, like the idea of Eve falling you know, uh, helping making Adam, you know, eat from from temptation, making making him eat from the tree mm. of forbidden knowledge. You know, the tree of life. Uh, oh, so, yeah. so you yeah, get he, that, but but at the same time, uh, uh, the betrayal of Delilah to Samson. There's, you know, this it's all throughout the, uh, the 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 Old and New Testament about the betrayal that when how women betray uh, men and what they can actually do and the damage that can actually that can actually be done by women. Um, but we don't even read those stories. Like, uh, how many times have you been to church and you've heard, or, or, or Catholic mass, mm-hmm. and heard these kind of stories? You uh, like there, there may be these stories, you know, that, that are told in Baptist churches or Lutheran churches or something like that. Mm-hmm. But I've yet to like you go to a Catholic mass, you don't hear that shit. No, you don't. You don't. You have to go to uh, like private Bible study sessions to hear those stories and for them to break it down. They don't do it. They don't do it for the general public. But but another thing, though, is mm-hmm. uh, another reason I think and we'll, we'll, we'll come to you in a minute, Charlie. You know, because me and yeah, Charlie, can you can just come, man. We'll drift, bro. Yeah, you we'll know, drift. We'll, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, too, we're two Geminis. We'll, we'll drift all night, all day long. Well, so I'll you better get in where you can, man. You, you just better get in where you can. Well, let me bring the uh, conversation up about wealth. And how we talk about it in the manosphere. Uh huh. I got introduced to the manosphere through ADOS. And the okay. chart I got up is about, you know, wealth. Bottom half of a, a black America is worth a dollar. Yeah. So when I hear a lot of guys in this space talk, it almost sounds ridiculous. Because hey, let me give you a hey, look. Hold on for a second. Before you even begin to speak, man, let me do this for you, man, if I can find it. Oh, hold on. I wonder if you can hear this shit. Damn, I can't pull it up, man. Pull up. Damn, it ain't gonna even play. Can you hear that? Yeah, I hear it. Yeah, we can hear it, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna give you a round of applause for that shit because... Yeah, yeah. thank you, J3, for the donation. And yeah, thank you, brother, for... uh... He says, I'm a simple man. BGS goes live. I don't. <laughs> There's hey, a BGS, man. Wait, 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 hey, whatever works for, for my scholars, man. You know. Hey, I, <laughs> appreciate, hey, I appreciate you appreciate BGS right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that were not shit for that, sir, but it, I, I feel you, though. <laughs> but, you know, I, you know, uh, my view on this is the same thing. I'm like, how can you, all this alpha shit, all this conversation about alpha is a self-aggrandizing to me. I just hate to say that uh, uh, because if you look at the condition that black men in are in in this culture, you're everything but alpha, dude. <laughs> I mean, this is what we're complaining about. We ain't even alpha with our own fucking women. Yeah, yeah. That, this that's is what why, we're complaining about. That's why. Uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 the nameless says what you have in this in the black community is not alphas, but sigmas and, and omegas. 
followers and in, 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 in independent rogue males. And you can't do anything but be rogue if you have some sort of, you know, pride in yourself. You know, I mean, but there are a group of men who, you know, I, I won't even call them simps. It's just that they're enculturated. See, this this is the double-edged sword of chivalry. And, and I, I think women know how to play men to the hilt with this bullshit, right? At the same time, that they, they want you to abide by the rules of chivalry only when it benefits them. But never when it when it works to, to the point to where it's going to, to somehow manage their own mode of being. Like if 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 the chivalry says get your ass in the house, you can't come out here like that, or take the bonnet off. That kind of chivalry is not, you know, <laughs> we don't want that chivalry. But they want the chivalry that'll pay for your dinner, and to jump in front of a bullet and die for you. They want that chivalry, the, the but they don't want the, yeah. yeah, they don't want they don't want the other they don't want full chivalry. They want in a chivalry in an attenuated form uh, where uh -huh. it just benefits them. Or you or you blow their back out in, in multiple orgasms. Yeah, well, you know, hey man. <laughs> You're still serving them no matter what. And, and you know, uh, my experience with women, man, is that, you know, uh, for some reason, they just are allowed to throw tantrums and, and ain't shit you can really do about it. And, and uh, just to build on that, hmm. when you tell a woman, I, don't, I guess, Adolf, we believe that America, I mean, black Americans only have $1,700 worth of wealth. And when you explain that, not just to a woman, just to any black person. They almost throw a tantrum right there in front of you. And you can almost do a case study on everybody, like Boston, $8 worth of wealth. Like, and there's so many men in this space that just, it's just absolutely ridiculous to talk about wealth like, like this when you have a few, a few millionaires and a few billionaires in, in, in black America. Thing is, the thing is, what we one thing COVID is going to bring to light, man, how black wealth actually gets wiped out. Okay, because a lot of black wealth is going to get wiped out during just in this couple of years we're going through COVID, just like it did with the uh, 2008 crisis and all the other crises before this, man. Um, seems like black America has always been uh, uh, basically leveled to zero because we lost ha during the year COVID was uh, the, the economy was actually shut down. Half your black businesses got were lost. In fact, like sixty percent of black businesses had to shut down. Okay, that's a lot of wealth. It just got wiped out, wiped off the table. And then we have to forget about the housing crash. I worked for Merrill Lynch during the housing crash. Uh huh. And so I got really interested in in Lehman Brothers and how that speculation mm -hmm. kind of just shot everything off the off the bridge. I did yeah. the Census Bureau after that. I worked for the Census Bureau and walking through the north side of Jacksonville during that time mm. and reporting the houses that were empty during mm -hmm. 2008, 2009 was almost depressing. Mm. And we back here again. Mm -hmm. and, and to say that we've been pushed off a cliff right mm -hmm. now, you know, and everybody right. want a job, I guess want a business. You know, they mm -hmm. talk about business and it's just absolute ridiculous when, when your business doesn't even have an employee. Mm. Man, look, look. I put it, I put it this way, okay. Um, I understand men want to feel. This is men doing what Lizzo is doing. I hate to say this shit. I, I don't want to equate it with that, but everybody wants to be acknowledged as valuable, okay. So if you can puff yourself up and make yourself look like you're valuable, and to create a standard for which you can perceive yourself as valuable, men are going to do that shit, right? But I mean, in the grand scheme of things, when you look at it from a macro perspective, a panoramic perspective, we already know what black men are dealing with. And we can talk about it and dismiss it and denounce it and say, well, you know, you're crying, you're whining, you need to step up and pull yourself through it. Well, mm -hmm. come on, man. Like these are systems. The first thing you have to do is identify what the issues are and the systemic problems that you're confronted with before you can even begin to try to make a stab at correcting it or fighting against it. Because I mean, if you don't have that knowledge, then you can't do anything at all. Because you just you're going along to get along. You are part of the matrix. You're just you're an agent. You may as well be, okay? Because you don't know anything different. But you know this black pill shit. It's like knowing that like 
dude, you, you're not the boss, man. You ain't one of them five people, man, that's controlling damn near half of the planet's wealth. You're not one yeah. of them guys, man. Mm-hmm. You're not one of them dudes. You ain't even one of them entertainer dudes. <laughs> They can fly. Yeah, yeah. They can fly one of these bitches out and blow yeah. her back out, and then send her on her way. You ain't future. It remind me of a Robert Harris joke with the man uh, sitting next to the man, the sitting next to the man, the sitting next to the man, sitting next to the man, sitting next to the goddamn man. Okay, not even one of those. Okay. <laughs> I mean, but we we but we like to perceive ourselves as that because yeah of our egos. Okay, but but and I'm even that way. You know, like I've been that way. You know, thinking mm-hmm. I'm. You got to know what role you can play and, and how to play it. Mm-hmm. All right. Just, it just is what it is. I ain't trying to be ignorant about it. I ain't trying to knock nobody down. I ain't trying to make a motherfucker feel less than a man or nothing like that. I'm just like, look, dude, if we talking about alpha shit in this culture, motherfucker, you ain't no Warren Buffett. Mm. <laughs> you ain't Bill Gates or Bezos. You ain't motherfucking the dude that, that owned the cars. What is, what is his name is, man? I can't even think of that shit right now. Mm. Elon, okay. Elon, Elon, Elon Musk, yeah, yeah. You ain't you ain't him, man. <laughs> you ain't Steve Jobs in this hole. <laughs> and that's why I really appreciate y'all in this space because I think one thing Ados pointed out about three years before uh-huh. I, I got introduced to the man, the, the manosphere is that the I guess the the doctors and professors are are scared to come in the space like you all, like Dr. Curry. Like Tia Sun Johnson did, because mm-hmm. of, because they they have no wealth to even yeah, affect the space, and and no and no and very little political power, and and really for them, you know, um, Gigi Gigi can't speak on it because um, he's still an academic. Uh, very little uh, power in the in, in in the academy either, so we can't even protect our scholars that that do speak out, like uh, is like the white guys. If if they you have a radical white guy. That's a scholar that speaks out. There's enough power and money to protect him, okay? But if Gigi does that, you know, um, um, he's gonna get punished for it. And there's nothing black men can really do about it. So, in that sense, yeah. But until we build some kind of critical mass, right? Until we can build some kind of critical mass, whether it's a, a social, political, or even monetary, there's, there's not a whole lot we can do to protect these guys. So that's why we have to build that critical mass because. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of guys that would love to say something because they see it all the time. But thing is, uh, um, um, some people can't afford to get punished like that, man. It's a uh, um, that's why I applaud the PhDs coming in here and speaking out, man, because uh, it's an incredible risk for them, you know, um, academically and in in in, in, in uh, financially and all that kind of stuff, man, for them to do this because uh, because because there's a whole bunch of whole structure, man, that frowns upon what they're doing. Okay, because uh, Speaking for the designated underclass, man, it's not really popular. Well, so. you know, what we'll, we'll, well, we're all talking about like, okay, who is the actual underclass? This, this mm-hmm. is why, like, okay, so you read Curry's work. Mm-hmm. He's talking about you being vulnerable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you listen, you listen to Tia Sons Johnson's show. Mm-hmm. You'll see situations in which we're talking about the ways in which black men are performing divine masculine, how they're actually succeeding mm-hmm. uh, despite the odds. But we already know that as it pertains to, you know, the interaction between white men and black men and the comparison between apples and apples related mm-hmm. to how they're faring and how we're faring. We know it's mm-hmm. it's not even close. Yeah. You know, like uh, you can go to college. A white boy can graduate from high school and still out earn you. Mm hmm. He's got social capital. He's got networks that you don't have. Well, yeah. yeah. You don't have those networks. Like, come on, man. How do you get a job? You get yeah. a job because of somebody you know, man. And the people like you and you socialize with those people. That's how you get a job, bro. Yeah. Now, if you got people who, you know, are finance managers at fucking, you know, Wells Fargo, mm-hmm. shit, you can get in there. You can get in there or A.G. Edwards or, you know, uh, one of these, you know, companies that work finance, you know, Bank of America. If you know yeah. somebody in there. Yeah. That's in, in, a, in a position that can pull you in and you're part of that network. Then, you yeah. you know, the better for you. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, I mean, 
my my uh, uh, old uh, high school schoolmates that were white called it a white bread job. But I mean, you know, but but the idea that everything is based on merit in this culture, mm -hmm. it's a lie. It's a lie. Yeah. But we, on the other hand, you know, we got this Superman idea, and and uh, and a lot of us we we feel like we're Superman if we're mundane. Mm. This is the shit that fucks me up about us. Like we feel mm. like we balling if we just average. <laughs> we're morally virtuous just by being average, man. And there's nothing wrong with being average. Uh -huh. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with, you know, black men being in the position that they're in because there's reasons right. that we can point to to demonstrate why they are where they are. I, I guess if you weed yourself to that minefield that black boys have to run through and you come out average, I guess that's a win. Man, I mean, shit. If, if you can read... <laughs> and you come out of high school, man, at the, the actual reading level, like an average person can, you won. Yeah, I, that's, I that's sad that, but true. Sad but true. You won. Like if you if if you're a black boy in the fifth grade and you can read at a fifth grade level, you're winning. Yeah, that's sad but true. And if I'm, you're in I'm the eighth in the grade and you can read it, huh? I'm here in the state of Florida and. I graduated in 99. The FCAT, I don't, I'm not sure if y'all ever heard of the FCAT test. It was a test that um, the, Jeb Bush was here in the 2000s mm. during that time. Okay. That test changed, I believe it changed Florida for the worse because it, it lowered the graduation rates when they were really high. Mm -hmm. um, we had the HSTT. It was a test that was, it was pretty easy to pass. Mm -hmm. But after that, the graduation rates fell in Florida and now you see the effects of it. Mm. Well, you know, but but this is like kicking the can down the road. Like, I, I, this is the way I've always looked at education, right? I would like for it to be like a, 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 a dojo mm. where when you can perform the mastery of the white belt, you get one. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is just, a, I mean, well, you know, it's introductory. So just stepping into the damn dojo, you're going to get one. Okay. Uh, yellow belt is intermediary. Then you got green belts. If you don't perform up to the level requisite for you being able to be socially promoted, you don't get promoted. Okay. But that's just the way I would do it. Okay. You learn and then like some degrees you'll never get because you're not good at that. That's the way I would set up the education system. So if you're a great reader, but you're fucked up at math. Okay. So we, okay. Here it's like college. You're not taking math. Okay. We'll give you the minimum of what you have to have, but we're not going to make you go any further than that. As long as you can read and, and write and add, subtract, multiply and divide. I'm not going to try to teach you algebra. Okay. That's not for you. You're a man of letters. Okay. Unless of course, you know, at some point you decide through dent of your will that you're going to master that you can, but we need people on different tracks. And it just, I ain't just talking about trade tracks either. Okay. I'm talking about, uh, you, if you don't get the, the knowledge that you need, you shouldn't be socially promoted, man. I just don't believe in that. And I understand the need for it because basically we got to turn kids in and out of a system. You can't just hold them back. That's bureaucracy. <laughs> That's the reason why I set up like that. Well, the, the, re the reason then, this is a teacher explained to me why they do social promotion at, at some point is because you don't want uh, uh, kids that are more mature and bigger uh, with smaller kids. And, I, and, th and that I get. I understand that, BGS. I mm -hmm. get it. Because I, mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was promoted. I skipped the fourth grade, bro. Okay? Now, all of a sudden, I'm in the fifth grade, man, with motherfuckers who mad. First of all, what the fuck are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Are you a smart nigga? <laughs> 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 you know what I'm saying? Like, I just skipped the, I skipped the fourth grade. They were like, he doesn't have to go to the fourth grade. I'm like, what the fuck, man? No, no. Now, now I'm with the kids smoking weed at the bus stop and shit. In the fifth grade, I'm like, these motherfuckers are doing some shit I have never seen before, man. Okay? Yeah, and there was one grade above me. You know what I'm saying? But, I, but, but, and I understand that. I get that. Mm -hmm. uh, but schools weren't set up like that back, you know, a uh, hundred years ago, man. But, it, but yeah. education wasn't compulsory either. And it, it, uh, it wasn't compulsory, and also a, a much smaller class size, where it was an integrated classroom where everybody knows each other. 
you have less problems with bullying and that kind of stuff. So a bigger kid is really not going to pick on a smaller kid because everybody knows each other. They're almost like family. Right. And so, you know, when you go home, like if you whip Junior's ass and you bully them, then somebody's going to bully you. Like, why did you yeah. why did you attack him? You know, yeah. but but the impersonalization of the school system all across the board, like we, we've out, it's just these schools are too big, man. <laughs> and the people don't know each other in the context of the communities. And so I, I get it. I, I understand. I agree. Oh, definitely. That's why also I would like schools to be boarding schools. If, if it's if at all possible, like these kids don't need to go home, back and forth, go home, back and forth, go home. Uh, if if there's going to be uh, people teaching them, but then, you know, the people have to be the teachers have to be a one and they have to really be caring and committed to what they're doing in terms of education. Otherwise, it'll fail. But, uh, you know, like these kids don't need to go back and forth, especially in these impoverished communities, because all they do is go home and learn the bullshit. And see and see dysfunction wherever they are. You know what I mean? So they go to school, they might eat, get some food, or whatever the case may be. They, you know, they might learn something, be, you know, stimulated to some degree. But then they come home, they don't do the homework, and then they gotta be around a whole bunch of dysfunction. I mean, I've seen households where motherfuckers wake up, man, they drink all damn day. They smoke weed, smoke crack all damn day. Oh yeah. G G, G G. A lot of your uh uh, this herb saint man, a lot of your uh, greats came out of boarding schools. Ella Fitzgerald, um, some of your uh, uh, Louis Armstrong. Uh, a lot of people came out of corrective uh, institutions, I would say, um, uh, as kids. So you, you're right. They help uh, develop that inner genius. And, and that way they don't have to keep being pushed and pulled from one environment to the next. You know, it's, it's like, OK, I'm here. And this is my this is my normal. But what you don't want to do is make it anything comparable to or similar to a penal institution, which is what these motherfuckers would make it like. <laughs> you know, uh, but these kids, man, if I had it to do, if I was the czar of education and for the black community, I'd be like, OK, yes, we're splitting the boys apart from the girls. You need a raise first. Yes, we do. Yes, we need to split them apart. Because we're not getting into the – maybe at the earlier years, I would put them together until the point where they're about to reach puberty and they start liking each other. Then I'll be like, oh, okay, this shit is about to get in the way. Now, you know they exist and you know they're there, and we can have them interact with each other socially on different levels at different you know periods of time. But to have them around each other would only distract and, and, and take away from their education with one another. But nowadays, you, this shit is so crazy. You know, uh, I mean, shit. You, you, little boys is like, I'm a girl now. So you ain't gonna be able to do that in today's cultural climate. You you're just not gonna be able to do it. Yeah, yeah. Intersectional politics, man. <laughs> it's <laughs> like it's like it. okay. So, hey, hey BGS, you put up that video about that middle school teacher. Yeah. And love and basketball, and what she yeah. said about the students by the end of the day. She couldn't figure out what was going on with that when they were dating during school. Oh, yeah, you know, that's uh, you know, that is common amongst uh, uh black culture. Uh, uh, that's why I call it a Klingon mating ritual, where uh, that's the way we've been socialized between black men and women actually, um, actually, uh, mate together, actually show in, so indication of interest. She doesn't just uh, play with her hair and walk in front of you like a white girl would, she socks you in your arm, okay, <laughs> and runs so. That's the way we're socialized. I, not to say there's anything wrong with it, but the thing is, you have to understand that's how it plays out and continues to play out. Like uh, even when uh, we interact online or in a bar or something like that, there's a certain ritual that we have to go through where they, I'm, I'm, the woman, the woman is mean to you. You have to over, uh, overcome that wall, get past her defenses, and then she's yours. Right? That's the way the game is played. Uh, uh, I couldn't play the clip that she was talking about. The thing is, my thing is that she thought that 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 kind of dysfunction was cute. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like puppy love and middle school love, and you know that that that's so cute. Them being smart with each other and then fighting. That's a uh, that's normal to them. So you know it, it, it plays out. It, it, that's middle school where they where it's more physical. But then as you get well, hell, even when you get older, man, you know, uh, Gigi can tell you it's still physical. Okay, it doesn't stop. 
it doesn't stop because you, you know every black woman I ever had tried me physically at least once. Every every single one of them. Uh, that's I, I I can't call it. But thing is, it's been it's been I don't know where it started, but it's been passed down um, from from generation to generation. So, but that's why we would need to separate when you're in school. I I would say. Um, uh, because, because the the uh, and even that's what Monahan got in trouble about because he called the black community a de facto matriarchy, right? That suppressed uh, the male identity. So his thing was actually to separate the black males from from the gynocracy or the or the female control and put them in male dominated spaces so they can develop their own masculine identity. And the females killed it. They killed it in in a Monahan. They killed it uh, when Monahan proposed it in '65. They killed it. They they killed it again with my brother's keeper with a, with, a, with Barack Obama. In fact, there's a. I got to read the paper where where there was a, a a professor in Chicago. I think she Chicago or Detroit, where she actually wrote. Uh, she actually compared the Monahan report to uh, my brother's keeper and talked about the misogyny that's that's instilled within it. So, so black women are actually absolutely a hundred percent against uh, separation or giving up control of their men, giving up the control of their males. Yeah. So, so the the thing that is crazy about this, right? So they mm-hmm. won't argue against female specific or woman specific or girl specific policies and shit like that. This that's good, but policies for you bad. That's misogyny. Anything that gives men a leg up will lead to pathology and dominance. Yeah. And th- and that's the, that's the ideological premise that I don't like. Mm-hmm. That's what I that's what I don't have an affinity for. I think that's bullshit. Yeah. You know? Uh because it reduces all of the pathology to one source. Mm-hmm. And that's ridiculous, man. This it's just in, first of all, it's not scientific. There's no empirical basis for this shit at all. None. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and it's been proven that if you get boys, uh, if you if you uh, so if, even for four years, in four years that 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 say the all boys schools are actually that boys actually go there, it's proven that it's like what night? What is it, uh, Doc? Like ninety five percent effective? Now that okay. I don't know, I'm not going to go on a limb and, uh, out on a limb and say something that I don't yeah. know about. Well, in, uh, in other words, the, the graduation rate uh, uh, goes to I think the, the graduation rate and college readiness goes to like like uh, between eighty five and ninety percent just be, just by putting them into an all male uh, dominated space, just just in the school system. You know, regardless, not a boarding school or anything like that, but just giving them a male dominated space to actually develop. You know. I mean, Which, it's just it's uh, simple. Uh, this, th- these people understand what you know what we need. I, I know they know what we need, but they mm-hmm. just refuse to allow us to have it. Which and they're using white women's language, mm-hmm. misogyny, in order to make an excuse for the shit. Yeah, it just is what it is. You know, they can have everything specific for them. They can get loans, and they can have co- corporate sponsored programs just for them. They can have organizations that are designed just for them. Let you try to create one. They're going to say it's misogynist. I mean, they're just going to say that shit. And then they're going to use the historical, uh, you know, sins of white men in order to demonstrate it. They -hmm. can't connect and tether that shit to you because you were a slave. Mm -hmm. But the way they tether it to you is to talk about how you're a rapist, sexist, and an abuser. Mm -hmm. That's how they tether patriarchy to you in in the form of violence. That's that's why, you know, you got Tia Sign Johnson and Curry talking about the black boogeyman. Mm-hmm. And, and it is all related to the subculture of violence theory, which is male specific. It's not female specific. It's male specific. But the only thing that's the saving grace is all of the uh, information and the data being accumulated from the wicked shit that the women are doing. At first, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't actually accumulated. Now we're beginning to see it. Oh, and it's yeah. being recorded. Yeah. 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 For, yeah but for, they, for, they're recording it themselves, as a matter of fact, because they're proud of it. And that's the that's even crazier. You know, like, I mean, they're on the online documenting, like, I did this to him. Yeah, I I, I hit his ass. Mm-hmm. I slapped the, the nigga. 
Yeah. Oh, I, you know, I pulled a gun on him. I pulled a knife. I I, I threw a rolling pin at him and all this kind of shit. Yeah, I ran him over with the car. I threw a window through his car. I beat him with a bumper. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like, Luto. But, I mean, you know, we already know this. But in their eyes, this shit is emancipatory. It's funny. But for black men, this shit ain't funny. This is not funny for us, man. Like, I saw something today. Uh, you know, on, on Facebook, man, where a woman shot at a man's car and he had a wreck and she accused him of cheating. She was following him, chasing him because she, you know, she thought he was cheating, but he was in the car with one of his homeboys. So this whole stalking shit ain't something that men do. It ain't just men to do this shit. I ain't saying that men don't do it, but women do the shit, too. Yeah, it seemed to be more pervasive. And uh, and uh, uh, I was telling Dr. Johnson, these COVID breakups are going to be dangerous for black men. Mm. So if you yeah. got a woman and you want to, and she in this COVID and you decide to leave, you better do it in the still of the night because she may get violent. Man, pull the gun, pull that back, put what they call it now, the blizzy, the blip. <laughs> 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 she might pull off the blick on your ass. I, I can't with you guys, man. I can't. I'm too old. <laughs> I can't with y'all, man. <laughs> they they calling them sticks, whatever. You know, you know, that's what they call that shit. Now I'm always up on the new slang. But but yeah, man. Um, I you know. Man, we, we got a lot, to, but but the whole thing is, man, going back to the alpha conversation, man, it's like, I just, you know, the alpha of what, man? Of the alphabet, motherfucker? <laughs> After our whole community just got pushed off a cliff because of COVID, yeah. as far as yeah. wealth. Yeah, and they're well, yeah. still having this conversation. It, it just needs to be thrown out. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just doing on a, an interview about that uh, earlier today, and yeah. And so what are uh, some of the? Well, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, no. No. Ahead. So I'm looking at what some of the solutions could be, like uh, for men, for black men in, in general. So if black men, th there's no way for nowhere for us to turn. We can't turn to white men because mm -hmm. they're the ones who originated and, and, and orchestrated the fucking plan to begin with to dominate us, shit, yeah. and, and to create us yeah. in the way that we are. They weren't conquered, like BGS said. It, this wasn't an issue related to conquering. No. The Africans conquered us and sold us. Yeah. That's what the fuck happened, man. It, 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 the thing is, the, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's, the, uh, it's, a, it's a trade, it's an indigenous server, the slave trade that's, that's still going on. It, it hasn't stopped. Basically, uh, they, they sell off their children that they can't feed, or they sell off the, the, uh, a woman or a child or, or daughter to uh, settle a debt. It still goes on. It's, it hasn't stopped. It's been going on for like 100,000 years. It hasn't stopped. The thing is, is that uh, um, all, all the all the white men did is said, okay, they're selling they're selling slaves down in Africa. We're gonna pull up to this port and we're gonna buy some. That's all they did. The market exactly. was already there. Yeah, the market was there, and then not only because the Arabs had a market, the African themselves, the Africans themselves had a market. Yeah, you know. So, uh, but the the problem comes with the indoctrination. But like mm -hmm. BGS said, man, like black folks in America did something that's never been done anywhere else. I mean, it, it was done by the Indians with Mahatma Gandhi, mm -hmm. okay, to some extent, okay. Uh, but they were, but they weren't a minority. True, indeed, they weren't. Okay, they were, they were, you know, they were just outcasts, you mm -hmm. know, of a different, you know, social ca uh, caste or whatever the case may be. But we're talking about, you know, a group of people who utilizing the language of freedom that white people created, mm -hmm. demanding that they be treated with the same sort of dignity that they say. They allow for everyone to experience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it was. I'm not gonna say it was just black men that did it. It was black men and women together that did the shit, right? Yeah. It, um, so, but then after that, it got all fucked up. Uh, yeah. So I have a question. Go ahead. Good evening, gentlemen. First of all, <clears throat> good evening, man. Um, you uh, invite me on the platform. Uh, what do you think about? our own media in terms of everything our own social media our own um license for uh paper uh licenses for publishing everything movies content everything which which will derive down into the curriculum system that you talked about earlier mm -hmm. uh -huh. um 
I, I'll sit back and listen to you. Oh, you, you, can, you, you can do it. Uh, in fact, the, the hardest thing, you know, because I've been, I've been in this game for like 30 years, right? The hardest thing is, is not to start it. Okay, you can start it. Uh, you can actually, uh, the techniques and the technology is even more wide open to actually start it and get that done. It's not that hard. How do you get black people uh, unbrainwashed long enough to actually support it? Right. Because okay, you have, you have, uh, you had like three uh, black variants of YouTube, right? And it's not that they, it's not the technology, it's the lack of support that they get because they can't, even I can't get my, uh, my, my, my subscribers over to my, uh, my other YouTube channel, not YouTube channel, but channel that's on a black a media ran outlet. It's difficult mm -hmm. to get people to move. It's, get, it's difficult to get people to, you know, uh, because um, and we go back to Ken Bridges in, uh, in Mata, we're basically uh, supporting black business interests, right? So your local black businesses, right? That, that was a big thing. This is back in the, in, in the, in the early 90s, right? Okay, and the, always the biggest problem is not starting the business, right? The thing is actually getting black people unbrainwashed enough to actually support the business, right? That's been the biggest like, thing, right? We have like six trillion um, in black owned banks, and that's our total black uh, wealth in banks that we own. And, yeah. and so, when you talk about um, how do we derive loans, how do we get people to bank with us, so yeah, we can, you know, get all of the um basically make our dollar fungible mm -hmm. uh, for us uh and yeah, then, yeah you know we talk the, about how long does our own money stay in our own community maybe yeah. after six hours yeah yeah claude claude anderson because i've spoken with claude Anderson many many times over the past 30 years right he'll tell you it's not it's not the physicality the money yes when the white supremacy is going to do what it does right it's going to always try to level set you the best way it can but the biggest problem that that, that internally that we have that they have you know trying to get this push forward is is the problem is not in our bodies it's in our ears okay it's changing the mindset to say that okay your your black business is worth more than you know the whole the white man's ice is colder right Okay, how do you get black people to actually uh, uh, support black businesses? You know, how do you get them to get behind black businesses and black stores and whatnot stuff to the point where we can build up to a point where we can actually rival any other business that's in our neighborhood? How can how can a uh, Asian come in and do business in your neighborhood better than the than the black person that might be down the street? That's the issue that we have to combat. How do so we unbrainwash these people? Should we also rank people in degree with a new culture, like give elders ranking? I mean, we, we speak about culture a lot. Yeah, because because culture, because everything else, everything else you see, businesses, money, uh, buildings, all that kind of stuff is artificial. It's built by culture, and culture is the you know, um, Gigi will tell you, culture is at the bedrock of all this stuff. Right. Okay. Everything else is built by culture. And the thing is, if you can't change the culture, basically, you can't, you know, you can't change everything else that that, that, that is derived from it. Because culture is the is 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 the is the uh, foundation of everything. I so totally agree. Is, yeah. And there you go. That's the answer. But, but, yeah, but my Wait. mindset was, you know, mm -hmm. I told BGS, man, some seven months ago. What's that? I said, BGS, man, uh, you know, I know I'm new to the space, bro. Uh, mm -hmm. I got an idea. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I feel like, you know, the men in the manosphere, man, is special. You know, like we, we got some issues. We're in agreement on some things. Mm -hmm. Man, what, a, what about a documentary? <laughs> and, you know, it, it was me being, you know, uh, practical and commonsensical about it. I'm like, OK, mm -hmm. we got to get this out to the masses mm -hmm. uh, by means of uh, a document, you know, uh, a mm -hmm. piece of a piece of media mm -hmm. that can be accepted by a larger audience. This is just like the red pill people did the red pill. Red pill. You know what I mean? Three the sheets with buck break and all kinds of stuff. It can be done. Yeah. So, but, but I didn't have the pool to do it because, you know, I, I hadn't been here long enough and uh, a lot of people are not trustful of, uh, I guess, or See, think that I'm charismatic enough. The in problem order. is right. And we didn't vote for this. We didn't ask for this. Um, I spoke about this the other day. You got six different entities. You got a, a man who wants to cut off his penis. The other man who wants to keep it. A bisexual who who wants both pleasures. Then you have the butch lesbian. You have the 
girly girl lesbian. So the woman, black woman, her, vo her voice is seventh. The black man's voice is eighth. So when we talk about we're gonna buy our own media, fund our everything and fund it from our pockets, meaning the black men's pockets, you see mm -hmm. where our voices is in Congress and Senate? It's in eighth yeah. place. Well, you know, I, like I said before, I, I thought that on principle, this would be something that men in the space found worthy. But instead of thinking about it, like actually catapulting the issues to the forefront and bringing about resultant change, what you got was backlash about, you know, who's going to be the HNIC. <laughs> you know, who who who's going to rise to prominence because of this, you know, and like, where's the money going? Even though, you know, like documentaries don't make that much cash, man. It's not like a fucking humongous revenue source. Mm -hmm. But what, okay, what I thought is, after the fact, I'm like, okay, what if you get 100 men mm -hmm. or 300 men or 500 men? They're like, I got 5,000 plus subscribers. I ain't got that many, but, you know, it's growing, okay? Mm -hmm. but, uh, but slowly, painstakingly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, ain't, it ain't like it's just bubbling up. I'm not bubbling, okay? Um, uh, but, a crime. Yeah. That's a great idea because I think one thing about us is and as men, we know hey, Gigi is the leader. There's someone who leads and men just go with that because we have an ulterior motive for humanity to restore back normalcy. So but but but, but I don't do that. but see we don't need I don't want an amorphous structure, but it could be it could be like this. If you get a hundred men that say, okay, we're gonna allocate over a year, three hundred to five hundred dollars to work on one project, and we'll all agree that for the next five to ten years we'll develop a plan, okay, to to work on media projects. But we'll all be shareholders in the company, and we'll direct the energy and the, uh, you know we'll like meet and vote. And decide what project to work on next. Ultimately, it's to get our viewpoints out there in the best possible light. And it can, it can take, a, I mean, it's just an idea, right? Uh, but First Brothers will have to actually allocate the, the resources to it. And right. then put in the sweat equity to get it done. Like, yeah. like, like me, I, I know I asked for a lot of bread in order to do the project. It was like 50 G's, right? That's a lot of bread, right? I got like 10 G's. I got close to 10 G's. Okay. <laughs> I got yeah. close to 10,000. Okay. Uh, but I needed 40 more and I wasn't even paying myself. Motherfuckers mm. think I was about to like be living high off the hall of money to, for this project. Mm. I was going to get the money right to the, the, the production crew mm. and the people who could orchestrate the event. That's mm. a low amount of money to get something done. But black men, just like these women have stories on Netflix and shit like that. Yeah. We need to be working on projects that could be at some point, but you have to start from somewhere. These people at Netflix and all these other companies have to see that you have a track record of being able to put media projects yeah. together. Yeah. And if you yeah. can do that, then maybe perhaps they'll bankroll one of your projects for yeah. a miniseries or some shit like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It took a while for it. Like remember uh, Al Grease to get his project off the ground. So um, it it's, it's a struggle. And uh but there's so yep. many content creators yeah. in this space. Yeah. There's no reason why the F the, the 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 talent indexes are here. Yeah. It's just a matter of them being coordinated and then people stop fucking disrespecting each other and yeah. fucking looking at each other like crabs in a bucket to yes. prevent the shit from happening. Yeah. I think there's more of us. I think there's more of us who have uh the commonsensical uh idea of solution. I think sixty four percent of mine are above you know, middle class in terms of the salary, and then mm -hmm. fifty-one percent of us are single and looking to be married. We're childless. Mm -hmm. So, what I think we make we make common sense decisions. We stay out of problems, stay out of jail, yeah. and we're ready. What yeah. I think is going to have to happen is this is a good time, gentlemen, to use decentralized YouTube media to come around and 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 to yeah. to build, like you're saying, five hundred. That can be a thousand in a month. Because we're using the centralized YouTube community. That can mm. be a Patreon. That that doesn't have to be up here where the wrong people can see it. 
we can do that stuff behind closed doors. But the thing about it is we can't let them see what we're ultimately trying to do, which is to have everything under our voice of uh, uh, the leverage of our own publishing, everything. It, it can be done. Uh, uh, O'Shea did it. O'Shea uh, did, you know, the, the, the Negro Manuscript was actually published under O'Shea. It did very well. It does very well. And uh, it can be done. The thing is, is, is the thing is, is how, how do you convince uh, a herd of cats to get, you know, get in a single file and actually march to the same step? That's that's the difficult part. Boy, I, 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 haven't, I haven't figured that one out yet. Maybe Gigi's, Gigi's smarter than me. Maybe he'll figure it out. Man, I can't figure it out. Not when you got <laughs> motherfuckers that come out and disrespect you and say you're stealing money from people and, and you yeah. ain't stole a goddamn and, dime. And, and, it's, and, it's, and, and, and Umar, you know, women give gave Umar over a million dollars, man. And uh, <laughs> and uh, they complained, but they still gave it to him. So um, 50, 50 grand to, oh my to God. Support, support your interest. <laughs> I mean, fifty grand to support your interest, man. Is you know, uh, I got thirty thousand subs, man, and you know, to to uh, to get a dollar each out of out of all of them, man. That's difficult, man. You know, that's that's, 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 that's the crazy part. That's all I was I, asking for is, is a dollar each, man. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know gambling, right? But this mm -hmm. dude put out a video where he was asking his subscribers and followers yeah. to guide him through Vegas at a slot machine with their donations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that's Dr. Umar Johnson. Yes, Once yes, again, yes. I'm not knocking you going out and having some fun in Vegas. Yeah. But with the people's donations? Yeah. You yeah. Me but, on that. It, it's it's women women donate out of emotion and uh, unfortunately women men donate out of fear, you know. So it's 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 just bizarre to me. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, it's, it's, it's his accountability to at least say, "Hey, I will buy a jug of water before I go and waste you guys' money." If I'm uh, <laughs> you know what it, I mean. But before it, it, I go, they don't they don't hold they don't hold him into account like that. So, and uh, but it, but the thing is, what it does is actually it actually screws everything up for people like Gigi coming behind him. Okay, yeah. because we have, black, we, have, we, have, we have black men doing that, which I, oh which is God. why, which I, which I don't like that because it's not that what you do is that they say somebody that's really trying to do something like, like, like most of the talent Gigi has is already will do it for at, at, at cost or virtually nothing, so he doesn't have to spend a whole lot of money in, with the uh, building, bring the experts in because he knows all of them. They're all his friends, so he can bring them all in for virtually nothing and get this made. And so you you're getting a, a high quality, uh, highly professional documentary done at at the cheapest price possible with virtually uh, virtually nothing, just production costs, and um, which and, is something and, I saw. Great and idea. then people don't understand, like they start seeing money, you know, like the average salary that that, that uh, you know, well, I guess half a high value man would make. Yeah. <laughs> and then they start saying, "Motherfucker, this motherfucker gonna buy a Range Rover?" No. 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 Look, anywhere you go, man, if you if you gotta film people in five to six different cities, yeah. It's it should takes cost. money, man. It's, it's gonna cost. And basically <laughs> that's uh the, the average the average cost of a documentary is right around hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars. And uh it be minimum. And but that's, I know that's I, talk advertising. To, I talk to different people, man, who I know. That have done documentaries before. I've mm -hmm. I've talked to people that Dennis Sperling knows who've mm -hmm. done documentaries before. I've talked to people that I know. Mm -hmm. You know, I got a guy in the city of St. Louis. He's a white boy, mm -hmm. but goddamn it, he does good ass work. Mm -hmm. Like all I care is about the goddamn thing getting done, and then we could talk about you know empowering the black community, you know, as a whole, like this self help, you know, self determining body of black folks investing in their own selves or whatever the mm -hmm. case may be. We can talk about that, but we hemorrhaging right now. We got, it's like, you know, you need gas right now. You're in a sun downtown and the sun ain't down yet, motherfucker. We need to get that gas. I don't like buying it from them, but we got to get the goddamn gas. And then we're going to get the hell up out of here. It's just, it's just that simple. But I mean, that was what I was thinking. I still want to do it, but I figured, you know, I, I, I got to pull more, uh, you know, followers and subscribers in order to make that happen. But mm -hmm. I think the best place to pull from is the people who've already sub not subscribed, but who are members of your channel. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So if you got members, they're already dedicated to some degree 
Mm-hmm. But but you also have to be aware of the financial conditions of black men in general, though. We're not doing all that damn well, even yeah. though we like to act like we are, you know. Uh, so it's 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 hard, man. It, it's it's a struggle, bro. It's it's like you know this shit ain't uh it ain't easy, man. You know, yeah, it ain't easy. But maybe yeah, one I, day, so, I just I, if nobody does it. If nobody, it, we're the only ones to do it. Now you can you can look for grant money in order to try to do some shit like this, but still they want to see some sort of background work to demonstrate that you're worthy of having a grant in the first place. Yeah. So the the goal is to you know the way I'm thinking is okay. Men need to have about a hundred to five hundred men need to, to develop a fucking company. Mm-hmm. They need to set up an infrastructure in which they can make decisions. They need to, to, you know, work on three to five projects in five to ten years or even more, you know. But, I mean, just the whole point is once you get one project done, okay, we got one done. And instead of taking the money and saying, okay, I want my money back in my pocket, okay, this is an investment over five to ten years. We collectively make the decisions on what projects come next. There could be proposals. You know, shit like that. But the whole idea is to eventually get to the, the Netflix level. You know what I'm saying? Where we doing series from our perspective, doing quality work to generate mm-hmm. revenue. And we can continue to tell stories from our point of view. And then there needs to be, me- you know, news media that we put out. We need to have blog sites and shit. You know, uh, I got a, you know, it ain't, it ain't difficult. Anybody can start a fucking blog. But mm-hmm. how do you get a whole bunch of different men, like 15 to 20 writers, Working on one blog at a time. Mm. Yeah. How do you do yeah. that? Yeah. That's herding the cats shit. Yeah, <laughs> it's, herding like, the cats. it's herding the cats, it's man. Herding Cause the cat. everybody want to be a boss. Everybody want to be that nigga, man. Yeah. 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 That's <laughs> instead of all of us being, in, instead of a clan being the shit, you want everybody want to be Genghis Khan. <laughs> I want to be, you know, I'm I'm Tubal Khan. I'm the motherfucker. I'm the nigga. <laughs> There could be only one. Everybody, it's the Highlander syndrome, like your boy Edward Anderson say. Everybody wants to be that motherfucker, and, and right now Kevin Sanders is that motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, you know he, he, he's the chosen one right now. So, but there'll be people who come after him, and it might not even be from this space. But YouTube is just funny, man. It's about virality as it, as it pertains to YouTube. It, it, it virality and, and 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 politics. There's a lot of politics that goes on YouTube that uh, this. Um, that's not that that's not exposed because YouTube plays games about who they allow to rise and who they who they um um who they um stunt. Like I've been stunted for like three, four years. I I didn't know it until like the last couple of years when I when it was actually obvious. But uh the, YouTube has stunted my growth over the last five years. And they can decide like who gets put up in the algorithm, who doesn't yep. get put up yeah. in the algorithm. Oh, no. yeah. And they're they're so nebulous, like you said, about what what it is capable of being monetized? What can't be monetized? Yeah, yeah. Oh, they, they they the YouTube uh, YouTube used to take a third of my subscribers, like a quarter of my subscribers every month, just psh, unsubscribe people. So, and, so and then it, they take away subscribers from me too. You know yeah, what I'm saying? I mean, they, they just do. they just like okay, one minute you got yeah a hundred of them, and then. And, Tomorrow you get fifty of them gone. Fifty of them can be gone. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they do. They they do. Uh, yeah, I think and, we just gotta continue to make sure we understand how we positioned in the country. Yeah. Well, somebody like Gigi can come up and ask for the money, and then they trust them because yeah. the the trust. Well, don't trust broke. me if if uh, yeah. this is the way I want to mitigate that from now on. Okay, mm-hmm. so don't give me the fucking money. Yeah. Let's say the money going straight to the damn production company or some shit. Yeah. Don't worry about the money coming to me. Just put the motherfucking escrow to go straight to the damn production company. Everybody agrees on the production company. Okay, it's cool. We feel they're suitable in order to get the work done. Okay, the money goes straight to them. They don't even come to me. You know what I'm saying? Then we get it done. Then we can get another project done if the money... Then we all need to be working collectively to try to figure out how to make it turn a profit and to promote it so that we can work on another one. Yeah, you probably got 100000 uh, somewhere around there, hundred thousand people, maybe maybe more now in the manosphere. Um, 
if 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 five percent get ten dollars each, they'll get it done. But the thing is, how do you get you know how do you how do you click on that key? That's that's well, the issue. Well, first that's people have to be all on one accord and stop trying to you know uh, you do is 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 a competitive space. People are competing for mm-hmm. subscribers. I, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know why when this shit is free. I mean, all you all, <laughs> I don't know I, because because eyeballs eyeballs equal dollars and. And when when the money starts coming in, that's when um, you know so the, the the love of mammon. So eyeballs equals eyeballs equal money, because that's come that's where YouTube looks at it. That's where Google looks at it. Eyeballs equal advertising equal money, and uh, and that's where the competitiveness comes in. And I get it, man. Look, yeah. people are eating off of this, and I understand yeah. that. Yeah. And and that's you know it's to be expected that people are going to you know be. You know, territorial. They're gonna want to, you know, make sure that yeah. they're not being outdone. You know, I, I get it, especially if you're on a daily grind doing this. But I, you know, I got a bigger vision, man. Like, I, it's not like I'm trying to get rich from this shit. I just want to no. do the work, so the work is out there standing, so we can begin to change yeah. some people's I, minds. I, I, I agree, and it's, it's a no-brainer. But uh, uh, sometimes no-brainers take a while. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to, that it will get done because it's actually a good idea. And you and basically you have the you have the uh, resources, which people don't realize you have the resources to get it done, because uh, if you weren't who you were, then it would be very, very difficult for somebody like me to get the people that you can get because uh, because I'm not I'm not I'm not in that space. You're in that space. And basically, they're your colleagues. I can get the experts and I can get get some people who I can get some people. You know, outside of the manosphere, you know, because yeah. you, you you want experts from DV. Yeah. You want yeah. them to come in and talk about some stuff. Yeah. You know, you want people from different walks of life who right. can be, you know, so-called impartial. Yeah. To, to yeah. speak on the issues as well. Yeah. Then you yeah. want the dissent to speak on the shit as well. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. you have uh, you have people that have, uh, well, I say have weight. In other words, they have credentials. They have a CV. You know, just not some uh, YouTuber. I mean, not, not, because there's very, very smart people in the YouTube space. But things they don't have a a CV that you can actually look up that will actually uh, add credibility and weight to any discussion. It's just it is what it is. You know, no, no disrespect to other people. The thing is, you, you, you. Those people are your colleagues, and that's what uh, we don't realize. So basically, w- what it costs us half a million dollars to do, you can do with fifty. Well, people that don't don't think that way. Because uh, man, I got them still on deck. All I, all y'all got to do is say the word that y'all ready to get behind yeah, yeah, it. So all yeah. it would have took, like you said, BG, mm-hmm. ten thousand yep. men giving five dollars. Not, uh, I, you know, it would have been unnecessary to get to have people giving five hundred dollars yeah. or a thousand dollar donations. Yeah. Yeah. All it would have took is ten thousand guys. Yeah, five dollars, man. Fuck, yeah. fuck McDonald's today. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Fuck, yeah, because the Magnum condoms or whatever today. I know that's hard to to bypass or whatever yeah, the case yeah, may because, be. Because you know, I think Tariq Nasheed, I think it cost him a quarter mil to do buck breaking. Even though he he's gonna make his money back, but the thing is, that's what it cost him to do buck breaking because he has to pay the talent. You know the you know behind the scenes, they have to pay him what they're worth. And um, you know, you get a you get a, a Dr. Tommy Curry man, he, Tommy Tommy Curry for for what he is and who he is, he's gonna be expensive. You know. If, if for people that don't know him uh, for random if he de- if he decides to do it you know that's that's the whole thing if you can get him and that's the thing that we don't realize and i you know i hate that uh, um that bl- sometimes black men don't have the vision to see uh see past their own you know pc past their nose and see okay what it would cost for me to, for me to actually go out and do this on my own versus somebody that's already you know in the, that in that field it will cost a lot more, and uh, so basically, this is about as cheap as you can get it done. You know, with 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 the, with the lineup that you're going to have, uh, it'd be impossible if you if if you could get all these people to actually sign on to your project, which, which is saying something because all those people uh, they don't know you, so they may not sign on because they're putting their reputation on the line. So, uh, and they, they and, and people do normally do uh, business uh, with people that they trust. So it's easy to, to do it for a friend rather than somebody that you don't know. And that's what they don't realize. I, I hope people get that 
get that through their heads that uh, this is something that we want. We want to rival what other people have done. And we can do that. And we can't do that easily because we have the people, they have, they have the experts to actually do that stuff. All we have to do is supply enough of the resources so they can get it done, which makes sense to me. But, um, but at the time that I proposed it, like, to be honest, man, I only had like 2,500 subscribers, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, I hadn't been yeah. doing this for a year. Uh, yeah. And I can was, understand the reticence. It's um, it's ambitious, you know. Uh, it was, and that's it was I, ambitious as a motherfucker. I ain't gonna lie. It's, it's <laughs> ambitious, and there was nothing wrong with being ambitious. Is that uh, you have to realize that uh, you know sometimes you're you're out over your skis, and sometimes you got to realize you have to pull back a little bit and uh, and reset. It doesn't mean that it's still not a good idea. Oh, it hurt a little bit though. You know, I was mad yeah. a little bit. Uh, yeah, I understand. Understandable. But the thing is, is that uh, it's the thing is that just because the idea did, it didn't you didn't get the resources for the idea. It doesn't mean that the idea is bad. The idea is still good. It's just going to take a little longer to do. So, you know, the only thing I would want is for the, you know, the, the big YouTuber manosphere people to, to support the shit, not because, I mean, I want them to be a part of the shit, you know, but I like all this, you know, I, I don't have the money to pay them, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. to, to make sure that they like rich or no shit. Like, but, yeah. uh, I mean, you know, uh, we 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 can we we can call in a favor, you know. For it's just, a bit. I mean, it's a, the, it's, we we have we have we 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 have an in on a, on a, on a big YouTuber. You know who he is, and we have an in on him. We can call in a favor. But the issue, I mean, you know, is you know to 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 have them also promote the project, not for the we, sake of money, but for the sake of the the, the cultural we, influence. Because you know, some we, things are more important than money, man. You we, know can what call, we, we, we can call in some favors. We got Fox, some, you know, we, that's Fox. We, can, we can call in some favors. I can call in some favors, so we can call in some favors. So. If, but you know, I but it, I did this it, on it my own. I did yeah. it on my own, and I didn't yeah. have as much influence as I you know. I didn't even think that I had any influence at all. I just thought that the idea in and of itself it, it, would motivate it, people. That's it, it. it is, it is good. And and uh, but thing is, you have so many competing ideas that are that are vying for the same attention and same dollars at one time. So that's the problem. But it, true, but anyway, true. man, I'm, I'm gonna have to bounce and, uh, and and go do something else right now. So uh, so I'll holler at you y'all later. Yeah. Well, anytime, man. You ever feel like uh, giving me that damn deck, man? I. <laughs> Oh, okay. You know what? I'm looking for a box to put it in so I can get it off in the mail because uh, I don't because I don't want to. Uh, it's got its own box with things. I don't want to mail it like that because it might not make it. So I, I'm just looking for a box to put it in, and I'll I'll, I'll actually put it in. I'll drop it in the box tomorrow for you. And, man, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, call you out, BG man. I mean, you no, no, so it's great okay. to me, bro. You know, it's, what it's okay. You... It's okay because uh, uh, we you've been had it, man. All you had to do was uh, but we ain't gonna we ain't gonna discuss the past. We'll let the past be the past, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> but yeah, I, I need just need a box for it, and uh, I'll get it out to you. I, 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 I was actually looking at the at the uh, at the at the post office box. Actually, looking for a bigger box to put it in, generic box to put it in, but they didn't have any, so. Uh, I'll get a box to put it in. It'll be out to you tomorrow. And, man, BGS, uh, you my motherfucker, man. I, hey, man, you. Uh, I got to uh, man. When I say I support my scholars, guess what I do? That's right. That's right. Get, get ten toes down, baby. <laughs> ten toes down, baby. Twelve toes. Twelve toes in. <laughs> All right. I got to bounce, and you. You guys support your scholar, man. If you guys haven't super chatted and or uh, or basically a cash app, cash app probably be better. Where you can get some meal money for spaghetti, so. <laughs> <laughs> but this ain't all about cash, though, man. I, you know, I'm just glad to have these brothers here, anyway, man. Yeah, really, I know just, you are. Just... I know you are. What I'm saying is, if if I'm here and and, and they're here, and they're soaking up the knowledge, uh, uh, they can they can throw up a buck or two and and support the scholar. So I always I will always say that. So, but anyway, y'all, I got to get out of here. So Thanks you, BG, for coming by, man. All right, <laughs> thank peace. you, bro. So, yeah, man, uh, if any of you brothers got something you want to uh, impart, man, please go ahead and do something. I've been talking for damn near three hours, man, uh, you know. Uh, no, nah, man, I appreciate you uh, inviting me on once again. The, the pills and the gems have been dropped. I'll, I'll back away in the comments and, and listen to you guys. Take care. Take care, brother. Any of y'all got some wisdom you want to impart, man? The truth or Charlie Brown? <laughs> The con the yeah. conversation was was uh, very 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 impactful. Um, I was thinking, Gigi, if I could uh, offer us, could I offer a suggestion? 
for a possible video topic. Yeah, I was ahead. thinking, I was just thinking that um, I'm noticing that we always talk about how the black boys need we need more support and stuff like this, which is very evident. So I was thinking how we could how how a way a way we could do that could be potentially like like I think I think a lot of these guys could use like better better ways in dealing with like the dominant society, especially with the with the interpersonal interpersonal skills, like already in like already in terms of like a generality, but specifically in terms of dealing with with um white men and especially white women. Okay. For various different reasons. We can, we can how, talk about that, the, um, man. We can talk about that. Uh, huh? You know, I'll say I can talk about that. Uh, would you like to be a part of that? Like, what's up? Oh, yeah, most definitely. I would love to be a part of that. I would love to be a part of that. That's, that's definitely that's definitely a, a subject that needs to be touched on in this, uh, this uh, feminist-dominated society that we are currently living in, like, um, the, the amount of the amount of uh, female bosses in the world are going to I'm sure that number is increasing exponentially as the years go by. So to be honest, I think these I think these skills, especially with terms of white women, because it's going to be dominant. It's usually. Uh -oh, sorry, I'm on the road right now, but usually I, I was I was on the road right now. Sorry, that's my little navigation. But um, does, but usually it's going to be it's going to be women from the dominant society holding these positions if not black women, but usually women from the dominant society. So I, I think that's best. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I sure. think that's that's definitely a, a, a starting point where we can get some things done. For sure, for sure. That's what I thought. Hey, you, well, let's work on it. Let's, let's, uh, I'll, I'll be thinking about that topic, man, and uh, email me. Uh, you know, my email is on my uh, YouTube channel page, man. Email me and then uh, we can have a conversation about that before I do it. You, you said you, you said you want me to email you. Okay, I got you. So it's a, it's G with a PhD at gmail.com. Okay, I'm, like I'm gonna you write see. like an in depth to like actual like I'm gonna write you I'm gonna write you like a little decent essay on it like because actually been there's been thoughts and ideas formulating around my head about the subject and so for sure for sure let's do that let's get that popping. Yeah, yes, my sir. thoughts were around I guess the guy brought up about black banks, like black banking. I, I think it's just, that's just another conversation that we just need to, I guess, hash out that there's no real black banks that are going to close the, the racial wealth gap. So it's just so many misunderstandings that we have about wealth that don't make us confident enough to, to give $50,000 or, or be a part of a $50,000 project that'll help. So how do we change the mindset? How do we change the culture uh, with, with the right information? And we appreciate you in this space, and we appreciate everything you do, Gigi. Oh, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate y'all, man. I appreciate you even joining me and uh, listening to anything I have to say, man. I appreciate y'all. No, you you real knowledgeable, Gigi. I mean, this shit is a no-brainer listening to a person like you. Like, the shit you be talking about. Like that's real militant, real essential in this soft ass culture. Thank you, bro, brother. Thank you, man. I appreciate you, uh, you listening, man, and uh, thinking I have anything of any value to offer at all. So I appreciate that. I do, man. So I'm about to go ahead and sign up on off of this joint, man. Uh, I'm about to get get some food into my stomach, man, and uh, get ready to wind on down. But uh, thank y'all for coming. And uh, thank you uh, for watching, for, uh, for the people out there. And uh, thank you for all the panelists and all the people who've donated. I appreciate y'all, man. I really do. So I'm about to go ahead and get off this thing. Till the next time, man. I'll see y'all later, man. One.